And there's the connect all without my head. Well, that's prettier by itself. <laughs> now that is a table bundle for speak what you see. Goes from the visual cortex to the language area. And right there, you got a normal one. And that's mine. I got a lot of extra branches. Maybe that's why when you put a keyword in, I get pictures. And at NASA today, I talked about, um, you know, how a visual thinker. Many of the people at NASA are mathematical thinkers. And we need the different kinds of minds to work together on things. I paid the price for that. I got less circuits for speak what you see, and that might explain the speech delay. Now, if you do work hard on therapy, the fibers that are left, you can increase the bandwidth of the therapy. Now, if the circuits are really severed, you're not going to fix that. But there's some fibers there you can expand. Them. And there's my circuit for speak what you hear. I'm definitely not an auditory learner. Absolutely, definitely not. And this is a picture that a young person drew in age nine in perspective. I was good at art. And everything was done to build up on my ability in art. Take the thing the kid is good at, build on it. If the kid likes trains, <coughs> Read about trains. <coughs> do um, mathematics with trains. Broaden it out. Because we're going to start thinking about getting them ready for a career. I'm seeing too many kids graduating from high school that have never had a job. I had a lot of work experience before I graduated from high school. Lots and lots of it. I'm seeing too many kids that are not learning basic things like shopping. I was doing that at age seven. Okay. Academic skills tend to be uneven. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes there's not enough emphasis on the thing the kid's good at. The thing that you can turn into a career. Okay. This is another picture a young man sent to me to show how he thinks in pictures. See, everything I think about, it's a picture. I used to think everybody thought that way. But when I talked to NASA this morning, so the first step you got to do is realize other people think differently. And as we went around and we looked at things, <coughs> I could see some things from the visual thinking standpoint. And I got to go in the simulator of a, a capsule re-entry. And I'm, I'm laying on my back in this, in this like metal thing, and I'm looking at a video screen, and I can see the parachutes come out. And then just as you land, they cut the cords of the parachutes. And I go, what if that was done at the wrong time? <laughs> you really dead. Really dead. And they said, you're asking really good questions. <laughs> because I'm seeing that that's a real critical control point. You don't want to have that cut at the wrong time. And here's a picture of one of my facilities. You see, when I design something, I can see it in my head. Now, one of the things I did to sell customers is I'd show my work. Drawings, pictures. I started out in high school with a sign painting business. And then that morphed into um, designing livestock facilities. I strongly recommend the educators working with these kids, especially with high school kids, let's, let's all learn how to you know, set up your business for self-employed. You know, I think the teachers, they need to learn how to do that, help them set up their business, have some business magazines. Because the educational world, I think, is too separated from the business world. So let's get some business week in that office. You know, some wired, some fast forward, maybe some science and some nature. Um, because kids get interested in stuff they get exposed to. There's all kinds of interesting things. Oh, Business Week's a really funny magazine. They always put some funny pictures on the cover. Some of them are really pretty goofy. <laughs> but there's a whole big world of work out there that's really interesting. Interesting. I got interested in cattle because I was exposed to them in high school. That's an important thing. I think one of the worst things the schools have done is taken out skilled trades. I'll tell you right now, robots aren't going to fix the busted stuff when it got flooded. That's not going to get outsourced. And I worked with a lot of quirky millwrights that were saved by that welding class in high school. And today I'm pretty sure they'd be diagnosed on the spectrum. And there's a picture of uh, the dip back facility. They built down at Schwartner Land and Cattle, Capital Land and Cattle. He just called me today. He wants to 
and wants to get to drawing so that I can build a real one. This one wasn't built stout enough to actually use. Uh, so he asked me to send the drawings. My drawings from 1978. That makes me pretty happy. Starting my career in construction. And I'm finding how much construction affects how I think. You sell a job, then you sign it, then you supervise its construction, and then you gotta make it work. And construction is all about finishing jobs. And if a kid ends up in the basement playing video games, when he should be working on NASA, that's not a very good outcome. And I'm not seeing these kids getting great jobs in the video game industry. That's not what's happening. We've got to get that under control. One bad thing I'm seeing is dad may be an engineer, good job somewhere. Dad plays a lot of video games, but dad goes to work every day, brings home a paycheck. Junior's uh, not doing that. Okay, and there's uh, the drawings to the dip back, and then I have to get those copied and sent off when I get back home. And when you're weird, you sell yourself by showing your portfolio. Nowadays, you can put your portfolio on your phone. It could be programming, it could be artwork, it could be a lot of different things. Because you never know where people can open the door. And I think a lot of educators working with a fully verbal high school kids can learn a lot more business stuff. And one thing that helped me is fortunately I had a contractor friend that showed me how to set up my independent business. And then I renamed my Oasis Apartments, the Oasis Building, in Sweet 218. No uh, Google Street View to give you away. Didn't have that. But I think a lot of teachers, they don't know enough about the business world. And I think that's something they need to learn more about. So let's get those business weeks and fortunes and wires and fast forwards. We need to get these in these high school uh, places and, and get a lot more oriented about how you get the businesses going. Because freelance is a good way for maybe someone who's a photographer. You can do that freelance. Okay, now I'm pressing the wrong button here again. There's another view of the drawings. When I realized my thinking was different, this was quite a while ago, I thought, everybody thought in pictures that was autistic. I was wrong about that. And I thought everybody thought in pictures. <coughs> then I asked the speech therapist one day to think about church steeples. And I was shocked that she got this vague, generalized thing. And that some people don't think in pictures at all. I also discovered that some people think in patterns. So when I talk to NASA, the first thing we got to do is realize that people think differently. Okay. Take the iPhone. The artist made the interface. The engineers had to make the inside of that phone work. That's the different minds working together. And today I was looking at a robot that had a complicated hand with cords in it that worked by hand. So that's going to break. I'm going to have to fix that. Um, so I'm already thinking about how I'd have to fix that. I'm going to have a stiff piece of wire on my space station to re-thread the cords back for it. I'm going to need that real, real bad. And then I'm getting to thinking, how do I keep all the little finger bits from floating around the space station? I want to take some duct tape, put it over like this, put it on the dining room table, and I'm going to you know, stick the finger bits on, and I'm going to float around the space station. You see, I can, I can see that. Because the thing is going to have to be fixed. Uh, it's not perfect. Well, I found that uh, I couldn't figure, I just thought it was totally appalled when I found out why the Fukushima nuclear power plant burned up. Not a very good idea when you live next to the sea. You put your emergency yeah. cooling pump in the non waterproof basement. <laughs> I am not kidding. Simple, watertight doors, it would not have happened. But you know what I learned about the mathematician? They don't see it. I can't design a nuclear reactor. I can't do orbital mechanics. But some other things, we were I had to try on a moonwalk as well. That was very cool. And my uh, nephew's been got a friend that's making spacesuit clothes. I was telling one of the astronauts there how he was making a spacesuit clothes. He got really, really interested. You see, there's the visual side of design and the math. And these gloves, that's not the, for the math side of stuff. Okay. Now, for me, I kind of see pictures of picture individual churches just flash up into my mind. See, everything I think about, concepts are made with specific examples. So my concept of a steeple, see, bottom-up thinking, specific examples make the concept. 
Well, that big theory, grand theory, top down. Verbal thinkers tend to be very, very top down. Yes, I do have a big circuit upstairs for visual thinking. Now it's fun to like look inside your head, journey to the center of your mind. <laughs> All right, here is the wrecked math department. Oh, it was right there. Trashed out the math department. See, I'm a visual thinker, can't do algebra. I'm seeing too many smart students getting screened up because they can't do algebra. So what saved me back in 67, when it was time to take college math, I was saved by finite math. Probability and statistics. A lot of kids that can't do algebra can do geometry. But I'm seeing kids when they're teaching them all this pre algebra stuff, but when they get to college, they can't find the area of a circle. Yeah, well, I know how to do that. Volume of a tank, that sort of stuff. But I don't know how to do it. Just, you know, practical math stuff. Now, <coughs> a lot of kids with uh, learning issues have a really bad working memory. So they've got to do a task that involves a sequence, like clean up the McDonald's ice cream machine. Take it apart, cleaning steps, reassemble steps. Give them a pilot's checklist. Bullet points of the steps. Put it in your pocket. Mommy. And then that avoids the problem where they go, oh, I already showed them how to do the French fry machine five times, he doesn't seem to be able to remember. Give them a pilot's checklist. All right, one of my most important slides is different kinds of models. I talk about this in my book on the autistic brain. I'm a photorealistic <coughs> visual thinker, and I can't do algebra. Now, uh, what I can think about taking that robot's hand apart, and I got stuck tape on the dining room table, because I got to go in the space shuttle simulator. That was really, really super cool. So now I know what it looks like in there, like where you might actually work on this hand if you had to work on it. And I can't have the bits flying all around in there. And I can, I can visualize that. I can make that in my mind. I can take that hand disassembled, put it on the table in the, in the, the shuttle module. And then I've got to tie myself down so I'm not flipping all around. I can't work on it. It's a wood. Okay. Then you have the mathematical mind. That's the engineering mind. Things in patterns. Not a visual thing. Uh, often good at music. Sometimes these kids have trouble with reading. And you can get little kids in fourth grade that they need to get challenged with harder math. Introduce them to computer programming. But the other thing they've got to learn is they've got to learn how to do tasks that other people want. When I did my first sign painting job, I did it for a beauty shop when I was about 16. I had to make a sign a beauty shop would want. You've got to learn how to do tasks people want. And then you've got the verbal facts guy who knows everything about their favorite song. Okay. Try different teaching methods. Education gets way too all up and we do phonics a whole word. A whole word didn't work for me. Phonics worked for me. Some other kids got the whole word. Math. Try some of the old fashioned math. I don't know what they're doing now. I don't understand what they're doing. <laughs> These kids can't find the area of a circle or they can't find how much, figure out how much carpet to put in the Use a variety of methods. I'm not saying throw the new methods away. But I saw a third grade teacher get in trouble for teaching borrowing and subtraction. That is absolutely ridiculous. I don't have any working memory. If I can't mark the paper, I'm in a lot of trouble. I'm not learning practical math. There's different ways you can do things. You know, it's sort of like construction. We're building two new buildings on campus, a biology building and a chemistry building. One is a steel framework. The other has a concrete framework. Now you can tell the difference when they'll build it. But when they're done, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. Because it doesn't matter. Concrete's a little bit slower. Sort of like, uh, you know, uh, they have, you know, some pros and cons. But basically, you're going to end up with two buildings that are really super nice. Okay. Try using the Google image function to search for cool visual math things. You take these keywords right here and put them into Google for images. You can find websites that you're not going to find on regular Google. Really, really, really cool stuff. Just taking these words here, type them into Google on images. Now to give you a glimpse into the mind of a mathematician. That brain man is made out of a single sheet of bullet paper. And what you see in the background 
That's the holy path. That's not my mind. <laughs> there is a great wall of origami stars that some kids made. And there I am, golden stuff. Okay, you got a kid that likes Legos? Why don't we get him some tools? You know, saws, hammers, drills. Give him some old forklift pallets while I'm ripping them apart, build stuff out of them. Give them more stuff to build with. I mean, Legos are fine, but let's get beyond that. So how do I understand really abstract things? Like I had to learn the Lord's Prayer. So here's my picture for the power and the glory. I've got a rainbow, and down at the base of the rainbow, I've got an electric tower. That's the power and the glory. <laughs> Okay, let's say we got a problem with a kid. 
We're going to troubleshoot it. And I'm going to use engineering terminology. And then when we have things wrong with hydraulic systems and meat plant, we're going to use medical terminology. Okay, you blow a line and have hemorrhage. But now we're going to troubleshoot problems with kids. And I kind of want to bust up the medical model a bit. And I find that when we're troubleshooting, people don't do a very good job of breaking down the problem. The first thing you're going to go, is it biology? Or is it just like rotten behavior? Sensory oversensitivity throws a fit. That's biology. Maybe you've got a non-verbal kid with a hidden painful mental problem. <coughs> he can't tell you. I cannot remember long strings of verbal instruction. That's where you need the pilot's checklist. And if the information is too rapid, there's a problem. I also can remember the frustration of not being able to talk. Very frustrating. Sometimes my mind that pitch a big hissy just to get attention. It was called a temper tantrum in the 50s. And the rule was no television for one night. But let's say you've gotten to where you're just taking too many things away from the kid. Then instead you give them some privileges for being even go a short period of time without pitching one. Okay, non-verbal individual, there's a checklist right here for hidden painful medical stuff. You gotta rule it out. You gotta rule this stuff out first. Everything that's on this list. Turn taking and conversation and activities. 50s, if I did not like the conversation, my mother would say, you gotta give your, your sister a chance. You take turns doing things, being on time. Too many kids today go to college and can't get up in the morning and get to class. I had a lot of problems in college, but that wasn't one. Once I had decided I was going to study, then you got to do some other family activities you may not really like, but the rest of the family wants to do it. That gets back to turn taking. So when I was a little kid, I'd be hostess at my mother's party. I'd to shake hands, serve the snacks. Too often times, the parents are talking for the kid. Mm, not my mother. Saying please and thank you. You got it. Parents and teachers have got to work as a team. That is the best situation. The rules of home and school, boy, they were the same. Okay, here's stuff I'm seeing too many kids today not learning enough of this stuff. Shaking hands, shopping. In the last five years, I'm seeing too, way too many kids never going to a store and just bought something. I was roofing at 16, I'm not recommending that. But I thought I'd want to go to the store and buy something. Ordering food in restaurants. I mean, these things were taught really young. Free play. In the 50s, mismanaged, structured meals, had to behave. But then lots of free play in the time. Outside. Go outside and play, make up your own games. I would spend hours figuring out how to make some bird kites. I had to experiment, experiment, experiment to get it to work. Yeah, you make a mistake and then you just have to try something else. Now this is a JPL. Yes, you've got some people that are eccentric here. Eccentric's okay. Don't be in sloppy, it's not okay. And there's a scene in the movie where my boss slams down the deodorant and says, you stink here. That happened. And at that time I was upset, but I thank him now. Definitely thank him. And that's how do people get into careers? A long-haired guy, theater major, switch to physics. Okay, it's okay for Deech to cry. Because when they shut down the space shuttle, they cried. I went to the saddest talk, it was in Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, there were the high school career day, and a NASA space scientist got up there, and they were showing all these pictures of the shuttle, and it was just after it had been shut down, and he was crying, and I was too. You cry, you still have the job. You throw things at their party. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no, they don't call like that. There was one NASA contractor. He got fired for pitching a briefcase down the court. And he lost the court case. Pitching a fit at NASA. That was like not acceptable. All right. Here's a rule system I still live with. I figured this out in high school. If you want a civilized society, you can't be robbing banks and telling banks. Really bad things. Don't do it. Then you have the courtesy rules. Please and thank you. Don't shove and whine. <coughs> different in different countries. You've got to teach these kids, like training them for a foreign country. Assume nothing. 
Drink it out of legal but not bad. I'm like, how do we get out of the algebra requirement? How do we get out of some blocks? Then you have the sins of the system you don't touch. For example, in this country, I'm allowed to criticize the government. Somewhere else, if I do that, I may disappear forever. <laughs> and the thing about the sins of the system is they're different from every country. <coughs> My squeezing machine. When I got into puberty, I started having horrendous problems with anxiety. And I talk about this in my book, Thinking in Pictures. And the squeeze machine helped me, but I found out in a brain scan study that my fear center was three times larger than normal. That is now controlled with antidepressant medication. Us visual thinkers tend to be the panic monsters. And even the non-autistic visual thinkers are panic monsters. I've worked with a lot of creative designers. They're all on Prozac. <laughs> Rule goes to Prozac. And you've got to use low doses. You get the dose too high, you get agitation and insomnia. It's got to be a low dose. And there's some interesting research now on ad adjuncts for depression. Folinic acid, not folic acid, folinic acid. Yes, and Amazon.com does sell it in Kirkland Labs. And carnitine, it's stuff that's in meat. And that seems to be helpful. And if you want to see the, the evidence base, use Google Scholar. Type in autism and no, depression and folinic acid. Depression and meat. They're even finding things like Celebrex, you know, an arthritis drug, helps on depression because it damps down inflammation. You know what else also helps? Aspirin. Mm -hmm. But nobody wants to study that because uh, I'm not going to make any money on that. Can't fatten that. But damping down inflammation. Interesting stuff. Look it up yourself on Google Scholar. There's way too many heavy duty drugs given out. But there's a lot of people with very high anxiety with a little touch of Prozac. Throw a label away, the doses are too high. The real, real low dose. You get too high a dose, they're going to be going manic. They'll be acting like you drank 55 cups of coffee and going crazy. There's a rear view of the squeezing machine. And there's a therapist working with pressure. Now, the thing about pressure, it helps some kids, it doesn't help everybody. This is the problem with the sensory stuff. You know, a lot of people just say, well, it doesn't work. The problem is, under an autism label, you've got so many apples and oranges together, where you have different kinds of sensory problems. Some kids respond to swinging, others don't. <coughs> Think of simple things you can try. OK, there's a weighted vest. I go on the Google Scholar, and I type in, um, uh, find some papers that it doesn't work. The problem is, it's a subgroup where it doesn't. And it's going to work on a subgroup that's a pressure seeker. These are kids that wrap them up, sell them up, and you can't try it. Wait, that's you can make up. You know, so just try it. I think it's important to get these little kids that don't want to be touched, the light to be hugged. That's an easy one to fix. Just remember, deep pressure is common. You got babies that don't want to be hugged? You want to swaddle them for 20 minutes? Old fashioned thing they were doing thousands of years. Just try it. Okay. Elementary school life skills training. Party hosted at my mother's party. Selling candy in the neighborhood. Shopping by myself. I got 50 cents a week for allowance. Yeah, I could buy five comic books for that. But if I wanted a 69 cent airplane, I had to save it. That taught a really basic thing when I was seven years old. My work experience. 13 years old, mother got me a selling job. Just made, made it in the neighborhood. Think of it out in the neighborhood. A little cash economy. How about walk dogs to the neighbors? You belong to a church, you need to get a church job. They've got to learn how to do a task outside the home start in the middle school. So that kid's got to do Thursday night chairs for the church. Every Thursday night. Got to do all the chairs. Doing a task on schedule outside the home. This is start in middle school. If Mrs. Jones is dog, you walk every day at six. Every day, a 20 minute quality walk. Got to learn how to work. 15 hours cleaning horse stalls. Went away to special boarding school. I learned horse stall management. I learned roofing, carpentry work, three years of not studying. 
until I got my science teacher got me interested in studying. Uh, 17 years old, I was selling the signs. You see that starting the freelance business? We've got to help these kids set up their LLCs. Fortunately, I had a contractor friend to help me, actually help set mine up for me back in the 70s. So the people that are working on this stuff, they got to learn a lot more business stuff. they got to get out of some of them. we got to bust out of these silos. And when I was in college, I did internships. I was going out to my aunt's ranch. I worked in the research lab one summer. We got talking at NASA about where I was for the moon shot, the first one. I was working at the research lab. And I can remember walking out in the backyard of a rented house. They had to rent with another lady. And looking up at the moon and saying, well, you know, people had walked on the moon. And I was, uh, you know, just about ready to graduate from college at that point. Um, college internships. We've got to get rid of the transition cliff. Two jobs. Okay, 16 here for working. I want a job. Two summer jobs, real jobs. I want to graduate. And we're going to stick them in the informal economy prior to that or in church jobs. Got to learn how to work. Absolutely have got to. But if you have somebody who's 26 years old and never worked, it's never too late to start. Never too late to start. Okay, while well, I was in um, high school, I was like fixing up our ski toe house and making it really nice. And I wasn't decorating with space aliens. And then when I was getting my master's, I was painting a few signs. That's me up there on top of that thing. I painted that big, ridiculous sign up there. And how did I get that job? I showed my portfolio to an old sign painter. Sell your portfolio. Get it on your phone. And there I am with my little sign painting business right there. When I was working on my master's, that was before I got my LLC set up. Heck, I, out there doing things. Oh, these are jobs that um, kids can do outside the home. Walking dogs for the neighbors, volunteer jobs, working in the farmer's market, volunteer in the nursing home. Learn how to do a task outside the home. Get them into mindstorms and robotics. Now let's get beyond the Legos. Let's see how many forklift pallet parts you could use too in your robot. Let's get creative. And there's the drawing that I sent to the head of Cargill to sell them on how you design the front end of all the Cargill sites in North America. <coughs> what you want in that portfolio, 30 second lap. Open it up, boom. This was back in the days where it was in the mail. Unfold the drawing, pictures, nice brochure. That's my brochure right there. Four color printing was too expensive in the 70s. So uh, I had to make really nice quality paper, black and white printing. And there's one of my designs in a 3D drawing. There's free software online. There's all kinds of stuff online. How about LinkedIn? There's another magic keyword when you look for stuff online. It's called forum. And if you type in music forum, theater forum, art forum, computer forum, it pulls up a whole new set of web pages that can be doors into all kinds of great things. People just aren't very creative with the keywords. Free stuff online. Khan Academy. The Destiny's charity now. But there's all kinds of stuff. Wolfram Mathematica is a really cool site. Uh, Coursera, free college classes. There's all kinds of things online. It's sort of like having the Ruby Slippers. Dorothy didn't know she had them. <laughs> she had them all along. They're right there in the computer. I mean, I'll have people say to me things like, how do I find a college for my kid? They haven't thought to look on the computer. I'd rather have them come in with maybe some web, few things of web pages printed out and say, what do you think of these? I mean, just the most basic searches. And I would love optical illusion because I got exposed to it in a science movie. You've got to expose kids to interesting things to get them interested in it. And there's the movie crew of people. <coughs> Lots of people on the spectrum there. Now they've got these jobs back door. They had a friend, you had a friend. Work your contacts. And there's the plant where I started. Front door didn't work. But then I was wearing this shirt that I hand embroidered using my third grade hand embroidery skill. And I met a lady who was the wife of the no. insurance agent. No, no. 
the movie tickets to Frank Manor this morning. But it was a chance meeting. I was wearing the portfolio. The people respect ability. And there were people that helped me. Because when I was working for the fire and ranch, uh, writing articles, we got a new boss, and he thought I was really weird to send it rid of me. And a nice lady who ran the graphics department said, we've got to get all your articles in a big scrapbook and show them to Jim. And when I showed off that portfolio, he gave me a raise. That's selling your work. Finding mentors. My mother, I had a great elementary school third grade teacher, Mr. Carlock, my high school science teacher, and at the ranch, and Jim Wool with the construction company. He helped me set up a business. You know, there's people out there that will help you. Okay, jobs for my kind of mind, the visual thinkers. We're the industrial designers. Remember, on the iPhone, the artist made the interface, the engineer makes the inside of the phone work. We are all of jobs, auto mechanics. Huge shortage right now, diesel and auto mechanics. These jobs are not going to get outsourced. Skilled trades are not for everybody. But you're not going to find out unless you get the kid exposed to the skilled trade. How about setting up complicated big displays at conventions? Here are the engineering jobs. The more mathematical thing. You know what I found? If you want to build a big Cargill plant or a big Tyson plant, who does it? Who designs it? The draftsman lays out all the complicated equipment. Not the Dorit engineer, it's the draftsman. Yeah, please don't put us in the corridor with the cable trays. I went to a big tech place and that's what they did. Engineers got nice offices. Us, the visual thing is we got crappy offices. Now, at least in the meat industry, they stick them all in the boiler rack. <laughs> meat plants are really, really democratic. Now, they didn't plenty of boiler room offices. Or you get the office over the top of the boiler room and open trays. Been there, done that. The degree to engineer does the more engineering thing. Refrigeration and boilers. The quirky guy in the shop invents creative equipment. Um, but the draftsman lays out the plan. Every single one of them is that way. You need both kinds of designers working on projects. A lot of verbal things. It'll be a great job for a lot of these guys specialized in detail. They get really knowledgeable, one kind of product. And when I book, the autistic brain has these jobs. I've got another book up there called Developing Talents that uh, has got lists of the jobs in there. Um, and then how about people with, you know, lists, uh, you know, maybe non-verbal. Let's look at things they can do. I'm finding construction really affects how I think. Because it's all about outcomes. And I get a smart person in the basement of my video game, it's not really about outcomes. Okay, let's look at medications and stuff. Let's look at it really sensibly. <clears throat> Giving out antipsychotic drugs with bad side effects to three year olds is a very bad idea. Very bad risk benefit ratio. Once you've got to think really logically, cost versus benefit. There's a lot of people out there selling a lot of expensive stuff. You didn't hear me quoting any of that. And evidence for effectiveness. Yes, if it's expensive, dangerous, or extremely time consuming, yeah, I gotta have real high evidence based. I was just reading an article, a crazy thing, where people like freeze themselves and I'm supposed to cure the arthritis. I'm like, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> uh, okay, you want to try a supplement or a drug. Carefully try one thing at a time. The younger the kid, the more conservative you want to be. But there's a number of older kids and young adults that are gonna need something for anxiety, a little bit of antidepressant. Um, a medication, if you try something, should have an obvious beneficial effect. You don't give out a powerful drug and then give a teensy weeny bit less high. Try one thing at a time, and it should have an effect that's like pretty well. Um, then you got people on cocktails of garbage where no thoughts been put into it. Uh, in my book, The Way I See It, I talk about medication. In thinking in pictures, I describe my own experience with anxiety. So if you have something with an anxiety issue, recommend getting that book. Be careful switching brands to generic. Every medication for any reason will not the same. Don't expect any drug to give you 100% control of the other one. 
Here are two great books you can get on meditation. You can pick these up online. But I've got to get you thinking, you know, about some things that medication is evil when I can use it all. Then you've got kids that are zombified. There's a place for careful, conservative use of medication. Medication really helps me. Okay, special diets, vigorous exercise, good evidence-based. Omega-3 supplements are getting evidence-based. Then there's folinic acid, not folic acid, folinic acid, and the meat stuff, carnitine. <coughs> Interesting stuff that's going on with that. Uh, are getting, uh, you know, some evidence-based things to try. Okay, here are the antidepressants. Know what your two best first choices are? Prozac and Zoloft. All the new things, they're just patent extenders. They're full, that's what they are. Patent extenders. Prozac and Zoloft are really good first choices. I'm not a big Paxil fan. I'm getting too many complaints on memory on that. But if you're on that and it's working for you, don't change it. It's a saying in engineering, if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. It's not the first drug you pick you ought to grab off the shelf. But if you're on it and you're doing really well and you're, everything's fine, then don't mess with it. That's true for about any medication. You find out all this drug you're going to die from it, it's been working really well about for you. But if you've been on it 10 years, you're probably not going to die from it. Okay. <laughs> Here are the heavy guns. These have much worse side effects. Weight gain, really bad. Diabetes, the tartar kiskinesis, a shaking problem. Now sometimes you've got to use a little bit of a heavy gun. And you want to use them at the smallest dose that works. And that helps to reduce the side effects. There's certain kinds of aggression where these work. <coughs> Low dose principle applies to these three classes. The mistake that gets made is just chucking a higher and higher dose at it. The blood pressure meds, they work for hot and sweaty rages, for the hot and sweaty ones. So the clonidine, uh, the uh, uh, propanolol, you know, some of those kind of medications. The epileptic drugs sometimes work for aggressions that are like a switch. Boom, bam, like a switch. Almost like seizure like. Then one of the epilepsy drugs, one of these things might work. Also called anticonvulsants or mood stabilizers. And how about the uh, stimulants? On the kids that have delayed language, they're horrible. But the kid that's the more you know, Asperger type, the ones that get mixed up with ADHD, these, it tends to work on them. Look up all your interactions, everything interacts. You don't want to be taking more stuff than what you absolutely need. There's a lot of people out there selling a lot of stuff. I'm taking an antidepressant, and I take a probiotic because I've got a urinary tract infection, so that's been working really well. I have to rotate them. Um, that's been working well. I take some vitamins. <coughs> I take more stuff than what you absolutely have to take. Let's just look at my genetics. Very typical. Father's side, fourth generation of bankers. My grandfather on the mother's side, MIT trained engineer, co-inventor of the autopilot airplanes. Anxiety and depression, both sides. Visual thinking on the mother's side. Food allergies on my dad's side. Mother's side, a lot of intellectual giftedness. You know, you see our brains need more thinking, our brains need more social emotional. The one just to become autism. There's no black and white to what I can find. It's just that simple. And here's a book about famous scientists and musicians that are probably on the autism spectrum. All right, now time to do some questions. I'm going to pick somebody, and then I'll stick around for a while and sign books and talk to people. Uh, I always like to do that. Okay, I'm going to pick somebody. So anybody get their hand up? Okay, right there. <laughs> Two children. How old are they? Six and seven, are they talking yet? Good. Okay, now you're asking what question you're specifically asking. Well, on a six or seven, a seven-year-old, that's pretty young. 
Uh, are they good at drawing? They, you know, the, 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 what kind of thinker the kid is? That often shows up around third grade. The visual thinkers do art. The little mathematicians like math stuff, both of those kinds like Legos, and the word thinkers can tell us about Legos and art. I'm uh, you know, a little bit young still. Uh, what are they interested in? She likes to sing? All right, well, let's, let's teach her a lot of singing, a lot of different things. What you want to take is broaden it out. You want to broaden it out so it's less fixing. Singing different kinds of songs. Some of these kids are musically gifted. Okay, right there. Yeah. Well, lots of, yeah, that's normal in autism. Um, but is, is, it, is, have is he talking? Well, the other thing you always want to look at is he making progress? Yes. And the little kids you want, you absolutely got to control the zoning out on screens, or really, really limit screens. And spending a lot of time doing things with people, talking, don't give them time to use the words, don't talk for them. Uh, turn taking, a lot of turn taking activities. They need to be interacting with people. In kindergarten, his teacher was just uh, worried that the uh, along with spinning and the flapping that he does sometimes is distracting. Well, what you want to try to do with the flapping is sometimes you don't do it. And then you can have the flapping break out the hall and and then you come back in and don't do it. I wasn't allowed to do it at meals. But I had some times after lunch I was allowed to do it. Some of these kids kind of need sensory breaks. She gets very, very interested. But they need to learn that there's some places where we just don't do it. Okay? These three. Okay, now three year old I want to get lots of hours in, FaceTime in with an adult. How much hours of therapy is he getting? One on one. One. And he's making progress? He hits a lot. And what's bringing out the head? Try to reward him if he goes two seconds without doing it. And then. Then you reward them for going 30 seconds without doing it, not a minute without doing it. What, what is he like? What's rewarding him? Well, what is, what is it on the screen he likes? Mickey Mouse, all right, let's do something with a Mickey Mouse toy with a figurine or something, where it's not just on the screen. See, some of this stuff on screen, I think it's like a joke. When I was a little kid, I used to love to watch cartoons, even cartoons that had the cartoons. There was something about how the lines moved that was just hypnotic to me. There were a little video game playing, and I've gone, why, this is like, well, I don't want to be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, right there. Well, oh, they cross over, the, there's genetic crossover. Don't worry about it. You know what? You know what? I don't really care what he's asking for ADHD. You know what I want? I'm doing a good job. And you know where a diagnosis gives insight, not on the job market, relationships. And I got a book out there, different, not less, 14 old lasties in good jobs that got diagnosed later in life to understand their relationships. Don't get hung up on it. Doesn't matter. The only place where it matters. If it's not, if that is where the diagnosis gives insight into relationships. And then you get into, do you tell employers on the mild and listen? No. I, what I did with jobs is I said, let me write it down exactly what you want me to do. Or if I'm working on a team project, and I've done some of those, right? Write part of a big report. I said, I just said, I didn't say I, I didn't know how about autism. I just said to them, I like to work. Okay, how about I do this section of the report? This line, references in this style, get it done by this day. Well, I just do my well-defined piece of it. Okay? Um, 
Okay, boys have it more than girls. You know what? There's a point where you just can't worry about it. All right? You walk, talk. You know, when people come to me, I go, uh, okay, what do I ask? How old? Because if the kid's three years old, I give you a standard canned answer. But once they get older, then I got to know where, I get some idea of where level is. Okay, if you can read USA Today, you can do any job just about that there is. That's all reading level you need for most stuff in business. Believe you me, I've worked with it. Okay, good at math, hate math. Try to you know, find out some you know, stuff that you do. Um, I think we have to start getting a lot more outcome based. But well, I've had a lot of older people come to me where grandparents realize that they're on the spectrum. And the older people, and where, where it gives insight is in their relationships. Job market, I think it hurts it actually. But I'm seeing way too much babying and not learning talking and <coughs> basic stuff. Like, you know, I'd rather look at it and go, now where is the problem at? <coughs> Working memory is a problem, you give them a pilot's checklist. Sixth grade, seven years old, I gotta repeat it for everybody else. Pinching your arm is not okay. <laughs> now, does it, it does, just don't let that escalate. Right. Just poking your arm and yelling. Well, you have to, you have to kind of, they got, there's some books that have like a target <coughs> zones, and uh, you have people you can hug, and you know, then people like a mailman, you don't know, hug him, or the clerk at Walmart, you know, they might be acquaintances, and then there's certain people you can do that with, and other people you don't. You gotta learn the rules. You just make it really plain. Who you can do that with, now they get turns into pinching, oh, it's not okay. <coughs> Just be really clear. One of the things is don't be vague. Don't hint. That doesn't work. You've got to just tell them like in a foreign country. Okay, let's take two or three more questions real quickly. Okay? Four-year-old? Now, is he getting, is he, is, is he getting therapy? Is he making progress? He regressed. Has he been checked out for epilepsy? He, he is epileptic. Okay. Um, so you already have got a neurologist, you say you regressed. He's a little kid under age four, and he's been the neurologist he's, working with you now. He's four now. <coughs> uh, Some of that, that um, regression is epileptic type of stuff. Well, the thing is, when you get into things where, where they'll say, oh, this kid can never do this. And then there's a point where you might be just overloading the sensory system with the therapy. That's not working. You drive them into sensory overload. That's not going to work. Uh, well, you always have to look at when you're doing therapy, am I getting progress? Then there's a point where you beat your head against the wall. I'm not saying you should totally give up, but you may want to try some other different approach to teaching them things. I'd recommend getting that keto, how can I talk if my lips don't move? Because he describes having to learn how to put a t-shirt on. And if his mother just yanked it over his head and shoved his hands in, he couldn't feel the sequence. So he spent five whole minutes pulling the shirt extremely slowly over his head. And then very slowly through the arms. Then he could feel how the shirt worked. Then he could put it on. He just yanked it on quickly. He couldn't feel it. 
And like I read another thing, teaching a lady how to put a, 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 an order to how to put a slipper on. And they take the shoe, let her feel the shoe, slide it very slowly on the foot, and to where it was continuous motion. And then she felt how the shoe went on. The other thing is you can't leave, the whole task has to be going in an unbroken, seamless way of teaching. You know, there's a point where you might be doing a therapy and you're pounding your head against the wall and you're going to stop that and do something else. And then there's some kids that aren't going to talk, but they can learn to type. Well, it's hard. It's hard to say. It's hard to say that if, you know if you're doing something for three months and nothing improves at all, and you're really doing intensive therapy, then maybe you're driving the bubbles. Maybe not be working. I mean, you can get into arguing about this type of ABA. I, I try to avoid all those arguments. The thing that I'm interested in the outcomes, like a steel frame building and a concrete frame building, it doesn't matter. But I want to get progress. That things are getting better. Now maybe he needs to treat it with some other different things for epilepsy. What's being done on that? <laughs> okay. And then of course there's always Colorado. <laughs> Okay, right here. How old is your son? He's six. Well, you gotta, what we have to do on getting on the play together is let's do something with a board game. So we did lots of board games in the 50s. And I had to learn how to wait and take my turn to shake the dice and move the little man around on the board, on the part cheesy board. But a lot of these kids are awful about, you know, not going to have to take a turn. He gets four boards. He's how old? And, you know, you've got to start looking at what they, you know, they can do. A lot of them get tired really quickly because of the sensory overload. If you work, teach them hard things when he's not tired. Teach him difficult stuff in the morning and when they're fresh in the morning. Okay, right here, okay, two more quick ones. Well, there's a point where you can force the point where it just gets stupid. I mean, we've got to be looking at, you know, functionality. Well, you want to try to encourage it. But I find if I'm in a noisy airport, and I can't hear what the ticket agent's saying, if I look at the ticket agent, I have a hard time hearing what the announcements are saying. See, because I'm trying to process two things at once. Okay, one more right there, and then we're going to go to the book table. Okay? Uh, my two years old? I hope you're getting lots of hours of therapy right now. Okay. I can give you a canned answer for two year olds. <laughs> That's where things can be the same. <laughs> well, it's typical to do a lot of the sensory things. I hope you're getting some OT. She's not doing any weird danger pressure on her eyes at all. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, with a little kid, you can, the machine's expensive, but you can just do pressure with a simple thing. Well, you have to graduate teaching not to do that. You have to give her some other ways to get pressure. I get good OT and sensory stuff to work with you on that. All right. So I'm going to end it now, and I just want to thank you everybody for coming. We have so many parents who've asked questions and uh, okay. and they love your answers. I want to start with a, a question that we got on Facebook that somebody wants to know your views on inclusion. 
Well, I think a lot depends upon the particular situation. And for young children, elementary school children, I want to try to do inclusion as much as what's practically possible because little kids need to get the socialization. Now, I was one of these teenagers that in a big high school, I, I was teased to death. Uh, it was just absolutely terrible. It just absolutely did not work. And I was one of the teenagers that had to be taken out of a big high school. And, and uh, you know, where inclusion totally worked for me in elementary school. I was in a, in a little country school, small, very small classes. It was very much, it, it was a private school, but it was very much like a small rural elementary school that I've seen in rural communities. Older, experienced teachers, and that worked really well. Um, but I was one of the ones that had to be taken out, and I went to special boarding school, and, and I've had some parents take their kid out and homeschool them. And all I want to say, if they homeschool their kid in high school, they cannot let them become a recluse in their room. When I went away to the special boarding school, I had a tendency to want to do that, and they wouldn't allow that. They let me do lots of different things that I wanted to do. And when I wanted to clean the horse barn, they got me insulated boots so my feet wouldn't freeze off. But I had to be at meals on time. Even though I didn't do much studying, I had to attend the classes. One thing they absolutely would not allow was for me to become a recluse in my room. And I, I had to be out doing things. But there's some kids where getting away from the whole teenage scene is the best thing you can do. And, and socialize with grown-ups. Yeah. Because I'll be perfectly honest, socializing with teenagers is not a life skill that I need. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think a lot of people would agree with you there at Temple. But on the other hand, I've seen situations where they decide to homeschool their teenager and he became a re video game recluse yeah. and ended up on Social Security going nowhere. Yeah. And that makes me nuts. Yeah. Because when I go out into the technical world, there's old Aspies and there's old geeks and nerds out there that would be di definitely diagnosed on the spectrum today. Old gray hairs my age, and they've got jobs. Yeah. Jobs they like, and they've kept those jobs. Well, uh, we've got another parent who wants to know what you think about the recent statistics that somebody was quoted as saying that in 2012, that the numbers for autism at the, at the rate that we're growing could be as high as one in nine. And, and what your thoughts are on those numbers? Well, some of it's just increased diagnosis. I mean, the kind of the geeks and the nerds and the Asperger's, they've always been around. Now, they're going to be changing the diagnostic criteria in May yeah. to take the mild, uh, you know, kind of socially awkward person and call them social communication disorder rather than autism, which is really rubbish because the social communication problems are the core deficit in autism, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And I'm... And, um, so some of this is just increased diagnosis, um, and I think there is some severe autism and severe problems that have increased, and there's also a good number of mental retardation that has now been called autism. Mm -hmm. You know, and mental retardation diagnoses have actually gone down. You see people seek the autism diagnosis to get services. And I think one of the reasons why in the DMS-5 they're changing, that they're taking out Asperger's, is they're trying to cut down on the amount of people labeled autism. I think the committee actually did that on purpose for that reason. Mm. And the problem is, diagnosis is not precise. And in my new book, The Autistic Brain, Richard Panic and I are going to be going through the whole entire history of the diagnosis. It makes you kind of sick mm. because it kept changing. You know, it's doctors sitting around a conference room table you know, making decisions on this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Have you had a chance to look at the DSM-5 temple? Do you? Uh, I looked at it when they had it posted on the web page. Right. I was able to look at it. It's now off the web page. But yeah. I did have a chance to look at it. And basically, Asperger's is going to be removed. And most of the kids that are the Asperger's are going to be called social communication disorder. And they say that that's not autism, which is rubbish. And I'm... And, um, they are also getting very murky about the speech delay. Mm. All of it, like more muddled and murky. And I, I'm just curious, when because I, I had a, we all had a, that opportunity to look at it and and to make suggestions. Do you feel like you would still be considered on the spectrum by yes. the the DSM? You yes. would still qualify. Yes, I would. I would okay. definitely still qualify because I had severe speech delay. And when I was a young child, I had all the full-blown symptoms of classic autism. Rocking, spinning, tantrums, no eye contact, fixated interest, repetitive behavior. Because um, 
uh, because basically on the DSM-5, there's two things you got to have. you got to have the social communication problems, and then the other thing is the repetitive behaviors and fixated interests, yeah. and I definitely had that. Okay. There's no, I would definitely still be diagnosed. Okay. And um, which kind of leads into the next question. One of our viewers wants to know what problems that you still face being autistic. Oh, I don't multitask well. Um, that's still a problem I, I face. And fortunately, I have a job that doesn't require multitasking or remembering long strings of verbal information. Mm. You know, it's um, uh, antidepressants have controlled uh, anxiety for me. Um, you know, I'm a visual thinker, and us visual thinkers tend to get a lot of anxiety problems. Mm. And a low dose of an antidepressant, some people a little Prozac, Zoloft, or Lexapro. I'm on an old-fashioned tricyclic. Just a little tiny dab stops that constant panic attacks and anxiety. And, and you have to use very low doses, because if you use too high a dose, you get agitation and insomnia. And if you're interested in that, I'd recommend that you read A Believer in Biochemistry. That's a chapter in my book, Thinking in Pictures, mm -hmm. or read the second edition of The Way I See It book. Spectacular. Wonderful. And uh, in particular, this, this same viewer was asking, uh, what, what really has helped you to become the person that you are today? Was it therapy? Was it social therapy? And what, what do you feel is the, the main reason that you've had so much progress in your life? Well, first of all, I had superb, excellent early intervention. And the kind of early intervention that was done with me when I was totally nonverbal, I did not talk completely fluently until age four. I had a lot of ABA type therapy. Mm. It wasn't called ABA back in those days, but a lot of things like my speech ther therapist would hold up a cup and say, say cup. When I was three, my mother hired a nanny who played constant turn-taking games with mm. me and my sister, constantly keeping me engaged. And, and my ability in art was always encouraged. You know, my abilities were encouraged. And I, would have, I used to just draw endless horse heads and I was encouraged to draw lots of other things. And, and um, you know, and limits were set on me. Like, um, uh, if I had a tantrum at school, the rule was no television that night. That was the rule, and it was enforced. Great teachers in elementary school, a very, very good, just older, old-fashioned teachers in an old-fashioned 50s-style classroom. Then when I went to high school, it was my science teacher, Mr. Patey, the head of the boarding school. Mr. Patey had a really good sense of when to let me off the hook and not study, but he was not going to let me become a recluse in my room. Mr. Carlock, my science teacher, it was a whole lot of things. And then I, there were some good people in the cattle industry. I mean, the movie makes it look like everybody in the cattle industry was just awful. There were excellent good people. Jim the contractor, Ted Gilbert at the Red River Feed Yard. There were some excellent ranches that did treat cattle right. And, and there were some good people, and that, uh, that kept me going. But people are always looking for the single magic turning point. There's not one. The other thing that really helped me, learning work skills. Mm -hmm. When I was 13, mother had me doing a little sewing job two afternoons a week in a lady's house. And I took apart dresses and hemmed them. When I was 15, I was cleaning eight horse stalls. I was doing carpentry work. When I was in college, I did an internship at a research lab where I actually had to rent my own house. You see, you've got to stretch these kids. Yeah. I'm seeing too many people on the mild end of the spectrum today, people a lot milder than me, that are playing video games on Social Security because they were never stretched. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I mean, I, yeah, the, my take on video games is one hour a day. Okay. I was allowed to play a 50s video game when I was a little kid for one hour a day. And that 50s video game was spinning a brass thing round and round and round that, that covered up a bolt on my bed. Mm. And I was allowed to do that for an hour after lunch, to just veg out and do that. Well, that's the same thing that ought to be done with video games. One hour a day. I love that prescription. And, I'm going to play this for my son, and, Temple. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I would not, never recommend banning them. Actually, there's some visual spatial skills you can learn from video games. I just was reading an article in one of my science or nature magazines. But that article, where there was a benefit in playing video games, it was only one hour a day they did. Okay. It wasn't eight hours a day. Yeah. Well, I, I love that because a lot of us parents are asking questions and saying, what's an appropriate amount? And, and an hour oh. seems like a great, it's, it gives them time to play, that's right. but puts a limit on it. So I, I love that. That's exactly what, what mother did with me with spinning things. I was allowed to have an hour after lunch where I could go in my room and I could spin things, twirl the brass plate on my bed, round and round and round, watch it twirl. And then, and then after I came out of my room, I was not allowed to do that. 
I gotta ask you, Temple, what was it about the spinning that was exciting enough for you to, ha- to do it for an entire hour? Do you remember what it was oh, about? Oh, yes, I remember. It, it, um, I, could, I, could, I could twirl it. It was sort of a hanging brass plate mm-hmm. that was on a screw that covered up a bolt that held the bed frame together. And I'd spin it at different speeds. And I'd watch how it went back and forth when it stopped spinning all the way around. Hmm. And I would do, I would experiment all different kinds of speeds of it. And I just sort of studied it like a scientist. Wow. And I found it fascinating. Another thing I did is I dribbled sand through my hand. We go to the beach mm. and I dribbled sand through my hand and I'd study every little rock of the mm. sand that went through my hand. And I would just stand there all day and I, and I would dribble the sand at different speeds, you know, hold my fist tighter or hold my fist looser and just study it. It's just fascinating. And it kept your attention. Oh, yes. And and um, I was I was given some limited times mm-hmm. to do these things. Mm-hmm. It was but it was on a schedule. Yeah. After lunch, I had an hour where I was in my room and I could do this stuff. And then at the table, it was absolutely not allowed. Church, it was not allowed. In the classroom, it was yeah. not allowed. And, and and when you how did how did they work through how, what was it like for you transitioning? Was it just that you understood that it was an hour and then it was over? Well, I understood. I understood that, and it was you see. And you see, but this kind of having a schedule started very young. Okay. I mean, when the nanny had, we had three meals every day, and they were on time: breakfast at seven, lunch at noon, dinner at six. So and structure was, was that, really important. I had structure, but sometimes you know things changed, and mm-hmm. I didn't usually throw. I I got nervous about changes when I was in high school, and I was going full blown on anxiety attacks. They wanted to change the schedule around mm-hmm. in high school. I got all nervous about that. Um, now they, I've had to move out of my office. We have a mess now where they're rebuilding our building, mm-hmm. remodeling our building, and we had to move all our offices. My 22 years of junk in my faculty office, and we moved into trailers. Wow. For a year. Well, I did that, but you know what? I did it slowly. Okay. Like three months before it was time to move, I was detrashing my office. And fortunately, they, they provided gigantic industrial-sized garbage cans to, for all the faculty to detrash their office because the entire faculty had to move out of this building. Yeah. But I did it slowly. You know what strikes me, Temple, is that that transition would be hard for anyone, but you are so good at recognizing what you need to be kind to yourself and to be successful, and then you do that. And I don't know that That's the rest of us do that. Well, and I did it, and fortunately, they had these big garbage cans because I hate to say it now, my knees are so are getting bad, and I can't lift, I can't walk upstairs lifting anything because my knees are going screaming, "Ouch! Mm. Don't! You're yeah. hurting your knees," and and um, you know, I would have had to. I, I simply can't carry all the stuff. Yeah, but it, but you you know where your strengths are, and you know how to compensate when you have an area that isn't a strength, and that's that's something that we can all learn from. Well, and you have to, I've learned things in organization. I, I Like for my calendar, I've got to have a calendar where I can see an entire month. Yeah. I hate those calendar books where it's a new page for each day. Hate them. Hate them. <laughs> oh, I get those from American Express and I just give them away. I hate yeah. them. Uh, and, and by the week doesn't help you either. You need to see the whole month. I want to see a whole month. Wonderful. Look at them. And then when I make my plane reservations, I can look at that calendar and then I visualize how much time I'm going to need between events. And I know that, and let me tell you, I know all the airline routing now. I'll bet you do. You know, I have that about memorized. <laughs> I'll bet you do. I, I've got a question here that you, you might decide is too personal and you don't need to answer it if you don't want to. But somebody okay. wants to know what role faith and spirit, spirituality plays in your life. Well, when I was young, I did a lot of thinking about a lot of the big questions. But basically now, I figure the meaning of life is if the things that you do help make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I have to use specific examples because I think very concretely. When a mother says, your book helped my kid go to college, Mm -hmm. that makes me happy. Yeah. Or you solved my kid's sensory problems. And boy, I can tell you, we've got to look at sensory problems. And there's some individuals that can't tolerate a noisy Walmart. Hmm. I'll give you some tips on sensory problems to help desensitize. Let the individual initiate the dreaded buzzer on the scoreboard or the worst ringtone on a phone or whatever the thing is they can't stand. If the person on the spectrum initiates it or if they hate Walmart, let them uh, control how much Walmart they got to tolerate. And when they give a signal, you take them out. I because love that. you kind of have to stretch it. Yeah. And then there's some individuals that will never tolerate that Walmart, yeah. 
especially some of your nonverbal individuals. Yeah. Well, you know, that's great advice, Temple, because we've had a couple of parents, one parent in particular who's written in and talked about how her son, his lunch and his physical education take place in an old-fashioned gymnasium that has all wood floor, and it's very no, no. echoey in the room, and that it's hard for him. He's supposed to be socializing during lunch, but there's all this echoey noise. Well, the problem is he cannot hear. Oops. I cannot hear in that environment either. Yeah. When I'm in a meatpacking plant, I cannot hear. I have got some auditory processing problems. I don't hear hard consonants. So when I'm in a meatpacking plant and we have to talk, I said, we got to go outside. I can't. I just tell him I can't hear. Yeah. And, and one of the problems he's got in that echoey gym is he simply cannot hear what other yeah. people are saying because there's auditory problems. The other thing, if you wear earphones or, or earplugs in the noisy gym, you've got to have those earplugs off for at least half the time because mm. otherwise your brain will get more and more and more sensitive mm. you know so half the day when it's quiet get that headphone off and get those ear earplugs out and w well one of the things that we had recommended too is going in and recording what it's like in the gymnasium and and maybe slowly desensitizing but what, that can help and what well, i'm hearing I, from you is to let the child turn the sound on and turn it off to desensitize put it on the recorder put it on the recorder but let the child turn it on and off and that will help desensitize it so it will tolerate the gym. Yeah. But what it will not do, it's not going to solve the problem with hearing conversations in the gym. Yeah. It will just make it so he can tolerate the gym. The other thing is, the other big problem in so many schools is fluorescent lights. Yeah. That's a serious problem for maybe 10% of the people on the spectrum. See, the problem we've got in the sensory stuff, it's so variable. Yeah. One kid's got visual problems. Another kid's got touch problems. Another kid's got auditory problems and fluorescent lights uh, 60 cycle fluorescent lights are just the worst and if you're in a classroom with that then get the the kids desk over by the window or if you're stuck in a room with no windows and fluorescent lights get some incandescent light bulbs in old lamps just get some old floor lamps bring them in from home put them next to the kids desk the other thing that can help is um try Try printing books and things on different pastel papers. Mm -hmm. Experiment with the colored backgrounds on computers. And also experiment with colored glasses, like the Erlen colored glasses. But that's way too expensive for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So just experiment with Walmart's blue-tinted ones, uh, some pink glasses, some okay. uh, pale tans, you know, real pale different sunglasses. Just experiment with that. Interesting. I, I know a lot of schools have the, their, um, for children who are dyslexic, they have, um, it almost looks like a paint chip fan that has different colored plastics that you can put over text for a child that, to be able to read with helps. dyslexia. And that helps too. And some of the autistic kids need to try that. Okay, great. And, and then if, then for these kids that, that need that colored paper, um, if, if the, if the, if the classroom has windows, mm -hmm and there's fluorescent lights in the room, put that kid's desk over by the windows, okay. and that will help a lot. That's okay. a real simple thing you can do. Great advice. We had a bunch of questions come in about potty training, um, about children who get obsessed with different parts of potty training, and for instance, one child that the, the mom reports that she wants to play in the toilet water and wants to flush it constantly, but does not want to pee in it. And another parent wants to know, is it common for kids with autism not to want to use the bathroom, and why? All right, let's start out with um, sound sensitivity. See, when it comes to running water and flushing the toilet, some kids love it, and there's other kids that are terrified of mm -hmm. the noise. Mm -hmm. And the, oftentimes you'll have a child that will use the toilet at home, but he won't use the one at school. Mm -hmm. And the problem you've got at school is they have those industrial ones that yeah. are really, really super loud. Yeah. And I can tell you the worst toilets, vacuum toilets on planes. Oh, yes. if I had been exposed to that as a child, I would have been terrified. I would have been sure I would have been sucked out of the airplane. That <laughs> Absolutely. Time. And I, I, I use them, and I use them all the time, and I press the button and I grit my teeth. Mm -hmm. I tolerate them. Yeah. But that, uh, they, I can just, uh, I can, they try to find flights for some of these kids that don't have a vacuum toilet. They have the old-fashioned blue juice one, because <laughs> those vacuum toilets, they are scary. Oh, they are. So, you see, that is 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 a noise sensitivity problem okay now let's the other problem you have especially with a nonverbal child is he doesn't know what you're supposed to do in the toilet 
You see, their sensory system is so fragmented. And if you want to understand this, you need to get Tito Muckapetahe's book, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? Mm. And Tito's a nonverbal person with autism that types independently, and he describes a scrambled sensory world. You know, it's sort of like looking at everything with Picasso vision. And he describes that when he had to learn how to put on a T-shirt, it had to be put on him very, very slowly so he could get what the whole task was mm. of going through the head hole, going through the arm holes. And, and one of the things you've got to do with someone like that is demonstrate how to use the toilet slowly, and he's got to see the entire thing. Like, how does the stuff get in the toilet? He's got to see it. Okay. You can't leave anything to the imagination. They got to, they, cause he, he's got to watch the whole task. Okay. Otherwise, they won't understand what they are supposed to do. Well, he, it's great advice. You can't break Temple. it up into steps. You've yeah. got to, it's, got, it's what I call whole task training. Yeah. It's great advice because I, I think, you know, we're, we all are so uh, concerned about privacy and but making sure that somebody models the whole task. It maybe isn't the prettiest thing. they got to see thing. how the waste comes out of the person and drops yeah. in the toilet. Okay, because great. that step is often left out. I have talked to parents where their child would do it in front of the toilet, then pick it up and put it in the toilet. Right. Uh, it, it, um, they, cause they, and they did that because they didn't understand the task. And when you read Tito's book, How Can I Talk When the Lips Don't Move, about how he describes learning how to put a T-shirt on, mm -hmm. I, and, he, and he describes a fragmented visual world, I think you'll understand better on working with some of these kids. Interesting. Okay, we will definitely look into that book. Yeah. Um, we have a bunch of people who wrote in and specifically just wanted to thank you, Temple. I, I can't leave that out because uh, so many people wrote in and said that your lectures and your books have helped them. I certainly am one of those parents. Um, but uh, a couple of parents wrote in and wanted to know what your feelings were about the Sandy Hook massacre now that it's, there's been a little bit of time and uh, how you feel about the way society looks at individuals with autism. Well, that guy had a lot of the classic symptoms and he's a, an example of a kid that was allowed to become a recluse in his room playing violent video games. And then he was playing violent video games, shooting the same gun that he used for the actual crime. Uh, what should have been done with that kid, he should have had a job at a computer store. Mm. Get your butt out of the house, and you're going to work in a computer store. And that should have been done with him. when he, what, you know, You're going to take him out and homeschool him? He should have been working in a computer store. Yeah. These kids have got to learn how to work. Yeah. And that is something that started with me at 13. And when you look at my different, not less book. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, um, different not less, is 14 old gray hairs like me <laughs> that were diagnosed later in life, yeah. and that gave them a huge, wonderful insight into their marriages and their relationships. Mm -hmm. But one of them, who was a computer specialist, her boss asked her, well, if you'd been diagnosed earlier, would you have become an expert computer person at Intel? Mm -hmm. And this is the thing that worries me. These kids are not learning any work skills. And just about everybody in Different Not Less had paper routes. Yeah. And I know that those are gone. You know what the new paper route is? Dog walking. There you go. That's a great job for 12-year-olds. <laughs> How about swimming pool cleaning, especially if you live down south? Because I want something that's not seasonal. Yeah. You know, mowing lawns is good, but it's seasonal. Yeah. But these kids have got to learn how to work. Absolutely. Um, uh, museums will take kids as young as 12 years old for tour guides. Okay. Um, you know, uh, you have to be 16 to volunteer in an animal shelter. They have got to learn work skills, and yes, volunteer work does count. Well, and our, our entire topic this week, we're talking about on the show transitioning from teenage years to adulthood, and, and some of the things that we're talking about are job-related because I think on everybody's wish list for every child is that they be a productive member of society. Well, in the thing that drives me absolutely nuts is when I go out to a meatpacking plant, there's gray hairs like me all over that meatpacking plant that run the maintenance department. They do all kinds of jobs there, not just working on the line. That's like grunt work. Uh, and there's are spectrum as they could be, but they're undiagnosed. Yeah. And a cap of Silicon Valley is on the spectrum. You know, it, it's where people have got to learn work skills. And then you have the kids, you know, there's different kinds of minds. There's the visual thinkers like me, going to be really good at building things. 
there's a lot of these kids that ought to be going to the skilled trades. We have a huge, huge shortage of auto mechanics. Mm. And one of the worst things the schools ever did, taking out auto shop and metal shop and wood shop and art and all of those cooking, all of those hands-on classes that can turn into great careers. Yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, and then sometimes we can do too many accommodations. Like here's, here's one that's a, too much of an accommodation. There's a little elementary school kid that doesn't, that's too shy to get up and do his public speaking in class, so they let him do it on Skype. I'm going, no way. You're going to have to get up in front of the class. Yeah. And I'll tell you right now, when I gave my very first talk in graduate school, you know what I did? I panicked and I walked out. Mm. My very first talk. But then what I learned after that? got to have really good slides. And then if you freeze, you've got your slides. Oh, that's great. Because we actually had a question from somebody wanting to know, what are your tricks to get over fear of public speech? So having slides that you can go to and take a moment. Well, let me just explain what we do with my students, because our my graduate students have to, you know, do their little 10 minute presentations at the American Society for Animal Science, where they tell about their research. And the thing I work with my students on is having really good PowerPoint slides. You know, where you start out with the reason for doing the research, the methods, you know, the animals, the statistics, the procedure, the results, the discussion, the conclusions, and nice pictures on your slides, and then enough writing on your slides so if you panic, you read them. There you it's go. It's not the end of the world for your first talk. Yeah. And you've, you've talked in so many different venues now, and we've shown your TED Talk more than once here on the show because it's brilliant. And I just wonder, how, was that, were you extra nervous for that, or, or was it just fine? Did you feel at home? I would I think was, that would I be was, panicking. <laughs> I was okay because I've done talks in enough big places, mm -hmm. and I was okay, okay with that. The only thing at the TED Talk I had problems with is, the, is well, they wanted me to wear this mic that was tight, mm -hmm. taped to my face. Mm. And I, I said to them, I've got to wear that for half an hour beforehand to get used to it. And I did that, and they had a lot of lights, which yeah. I don't really like, but I tolerated it because <laughs> I, wanted it, I wanted it to look good, and they wanted it to sound good. Yeah. And that's why they taped the mic to my cheek. Well, it did look good, and it sounded great, and you were brilliant, and we we love that TED Talk. Um, I have an, another viewer who, her question is, how can I learn to control involuntary movements? I have trouble with it, and it's very distracting. And what you have to try to do is to turn it into an involuntary movement that doesn't bother people. Mm. I know a guy that has Tourette's, and you'd never know it because he twitches his mouth and his eye. Mm. And it's something that, yeah, he does it every 30 seconds, but nobody notices. I never noticed it until he told me about it. If you can try to switch the involuntary movement into something that's less... Uh, uh, distracting. You know, there's a lot of people that sit in meetings and they jiggle their leg in yeah. meetings. Have you ever done that? Oh, yes, absolutely. And there are people who click their pens. Well, that gets annoying. It does. <laughs> and I do a lo awful lot of doodling. That's great. Where I just take a pen and I'm drawing circles and I'm drawing little triangles and, and stars and stuff on a piece of paper. You know, you could do that. You could get a fidget ball. I think what you need to try to do is to try to turn that into something. Uh, you Because what can be done with Tourette's is, to, is you can't get rid of the ticks. What you do is you change them into something else okay. that's a lot less annoying and distracting. Okay. And what this guy did is he took a bad verbal tick and he turned it into twitching his mouth and his eye every 30 seconds. And nobody notices it. There you go. Wonderful. Okay. Another viewer wants to know, what's your experience with fragmented vision, seeing only the details of things and not the whole picture? They report that, she says, I see so many details, but I can never just see the whole object that I'm looking at, and I'm wondering uh, what this is and how to understand it. Well, I had a student that had that problem, and she was not autistic. She was dyslexic, and, mm. and I remember one time we were sitting at a traffic light, next to this art store and I say, Artarama, that's a funny name for store. And she said, all I saw was the A. Mm. And uh, Tito describes this, you know, in How Can I Talk My Lips Don't Move. Donna Williams, in her book Autism, an Inside Out Approach, describes um, this problem. Now, I don't have this. This is where autism is very, very, very variable. Mm -hmm. It's real, real variable. And I don't have this problem. It, it's... Um, you know, this is something that, um, I, you know, not everybody on the spectrum has. Mm -hmm. 
but that they can go to those resources and maybe learn some more about it and what yeah. to do about it. So Tito's book again. Um, That's right. I... Uh, there's somebody who wrote in, and I, I'm unaware of this. Apparently, there you are very good friends. Wait, wait. Somebody's at my door. I'm going to have to let them in. Just a minute. Okay. We'll hold on. Uh, I'll let all the viewers know that who we're talking to right now is Temple Grandin, if you're just tuning in. She's joining us via phone, and she's answering parent questions that you guys have written in. And it's a very ex exciting opportunity for us to be able to talk with her, and we hope we'll have more opportunities to do this. So if you haven't written in a question uh, for Temple Grandin, and you still want to do because we keep a pool of them so that if we have the opportunity to talk to her again. Oh, she... Sorry, this is where I don't multitask very well. Oh, no, I thought you did very well. Are you kidding me? Okay. And we were just filling our viewers in on what was happening. So, um, but do you have a few more minutes to talk, Temple? Yes, I do. Okay, great. So um, somebody wrote in and said that you have, uh, that you're good friends with somebody who's blind. Yes. And, um, and that their best friend is blind. And their question is, um, do you narrate and describe scenes with ease to the friend that's, that's blind? Um, and does that build trust between you? Um, because this, uh, the person reports that they're very inspired by the fact that you also have a friend that's blind. Well, she was my, my roommate. And, um, we would used to go to movies, and mm -hmm. I'd sit in the we'd sit in the back row, and I would whisper to her what was the what the visual parts of the movie. Mm. How beautiful! And then we and then she had a radio that would pick up TV signals, mm. and we used to watch Star Trek on her radio. How wonderful! And Star I Trek was pretty good on the radio because I knew what the visuals looked like. And was it easy for you to describe those things to her? Yes, that was very, very easy because I'm a total visual thinker. There you go. So it was very, very easy for me to describe the visuals to her. What a gift to each other. You, yeah, you we must were, have been. she was the best roommate I ever had. And Temple, is it, uh, is it easy for you to have friends? Is it something that you struggle with or is it something that you're really adept at now? Well, my, most of my friends are through shared interests. And one thing I really recommend to all the parents out there, get autistic kids or kids that have got whatever diagnosis they got, whatever labels on them, get them involved with things with shared interests. Mm -hmm. School play, band, school newspaper, art club, computer club, robotics, future farmers of America, 4-H, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Get involved in activities where they have a shared interest. I think that's great advice. We actually had a parent write in on Friday about having a teenager and how there aren't supports, but that she has him in a, a, a sailing club and a couple of Good. other clubs. Good. And um, and we had said, you know, clubs are great. Um, so she she felt like maybe, but she's wanting something more. And, and I know you talked earlier about volunteering to get them ready for job skills. Is there anything else we should be focusing on with our teenagers? Well, I, middle school, we need to start focusing on job skills. And okay. volunteer work does count, and I think it needs to be work outside the home. You know, it could be a tour guide. It could be, um, uh, you know, cleaning the swimming pools, walk some dogs. People that live in the city, live in, a, in, a, in an area where there's a lot of dogs around, walking dogs, is, the, as far as I'm concerned, that's a new paper route. Okay. We need to be giving these kids a job that's a lot like a paper route, where they got to do it every day and have that responsibility of doing it. And does it need to be something that is in their area of interest, or it just is a job and they get paid for it? Or Sometimes they... it needs to just be a job. I don't think cleaning pools would be in anybody's interest. Yeah. But sometimes they just need to do a job. Okay. They need to learn how to work. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think for a lot of our kids on the autism spectrum, they have a really good work, work ethic, especially those that have had a great deal of ABA. They sort of get it that my time is taken up doing this right now. Um, but I do see that as you get into those teenage years, it gets a little bit rougher. Well, I don't think, you see, first of all, I, gave, I watched a big, long talk with Kristen Smith, who's a specialist in ABA, and he said basically ABA is a little kid's program, you know, unless, they're, unless it's real severe autism. Uh, and... And, you know, you get most people on the higher end of the spectrum. I mean, they're beyond ABA. Yeah. We need to be, um, but they need to learn work skills. Absolutely. Uh, we, we have a viewer who wants to know when you're coming back to Portland, Oregon. I don't know. I don't have anything scheduled. Oh, wait a minute. I've got, I've got a, on my book tour, I've got some stuff scheduled. Wait a minute. I've got to see if I am coming to Portland. I know I'm coming into Seattle. Let me just look at my book schedule for the autistic brain um, let me just look uh, Portland on the 26th of June 
I'll be in at Powell's Bookstore on the okay. 26th of June. Okay, great. So that's when you will be in Portland. Yeah, that's and when I, I'll be in Portland. I know you've got a bunch of different events that are coming up, places that you're speaking. I know you're getting ready to speak in Dallas um, yeah. the, week, the week right before Easter. Is there anything else, a place that you're going that you'd like to tell our viewers about where they can get to meet you? Well, I... I uh, going to a lot of different places, and I'm not that good about getting everything up on the web page. That's okay. I mean, people can search, and and um, I, you know, I mean, I was able to see that you. Were I can be tell you some of the places I'll be at for the book tour for the autistic brain. Okay. I will be on the 21st of May. I'll be at L.A., Los Angeles, uh, at the University at Riverside, okay. and then on the 27th of May, I will be at the Los Angeles Public Library. And then um, I'll be in New York. I've got a. Um, I'll be in New York. Uh, they've got me um, on the 29th and the 30th, but I don't know where. I'll be in Washington D.C. on on the 1st of May. Um, I'm not sure where yet. I'll be at LaSalle University outside of Philadelphia on the 3rd. Also at the Philadelphia Public Library. Pensacola, Florida, on the 14th of May. Um, I'll be at an Asperger meeting. Oh, wait a minute, that's in Sydney, Australia. You don't want that. Oh, yes, we have viewers that watch us in Australia. Well, okay, well, I'll be Sydney, Australia, Asperger Association. Uh, that's going to be the 1st of June. Okay. And then... Um, San Francisco on the 5th of June and the 4th of June. 4th and 5th of June in San Francisco. Atlanta on the 19th of June. You do you do get around, don't you, Temple? You're yeah, a very no, busy lady. You're I'll racking up some miles. I'll be at the Tattered Covered Bookstore in Denver on the 27th. I love that uh, store. Okay, so that's some of the places I'll be at for the book tour for the autistic brain. Okay. And uh, people can also, um, and the publicist is Taryn Roeder at, um, at Houghton Mifflin. Okay. So if people, that's a great opportunity for them to come and have an opportunity to meet yes. and greet with you and get a book yes. signed perhaps, and which is a that's lovely right. thing because people do want to meet you, Temple. It's, yes. uh, you know, I was very excited to meet you. Uh, uh, about a month ago, and and everyone was so excited to ask me about what it was like meeting you. And I gotta say, it was one of the highlights of my life, Temple, to meet well, you. Thank you. Really, thank you. really remarkable. And since you're gonna be in LA, <laughs> maybe we could talk about if you have an extra couple of minutes, we'd love to have you come into the studio. Um, Probably will not have time to do okay. that. Okay. All right. Well, I'll 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 sacrifice that because we get time to talk to you on the phone from time to time. Um, but one more question that I have for you, okay. Temple. Um, because I know you have to go, but um, for we we have a lot of people who've written in and asked questions about um, the teen years and about dealing with love interests. And well, the uh, teen years uh, were the worst part of my life. And I would recommend that they get a book that I did with Sean Barron called The Unwritten Social Rules. Mm. I was the kind of teenager, I was a pure geek who wasn't interested in those things, where Sean was. Mm -hmm. And Sean didn't know how to deal with it. And and I, most of the marriages where things have worked out well, it's been through shared interests. Yeah. You know, two computer people or two people that like dogs or whatever, whatever their interest is. And um, also, they've got to learn the certain rules. You don't want to get busted for stalking. Right. You certainly don't want to get on a sex offender website. Right. There are some very, very strict rules. And the thing that's interesting is I'm very different from Sean. We were the same on sensory problems, fixated interests. That was all the same. But where we were different is Sean had, had so much more social interest mm -hmm. than I do. And in that book, Sean tells his story in his words. I tell my story in my words. And then Veronica Zisk is the editor. And I think uh, teens dealing with those kind of issues will find that book helpful. Okay. What's the name of the book again? Unwritten Social Rules. Okay. And it's published by Future Horizons out of Texas. Wonderful. Temple, I thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And uh, I hope that we'll have the opportunity to do, do it again in the coming months. And I, I look forward to hearing about all the different places that you're going to be. And we'll stay in touch. That sounds great. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Temple. All right. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. and welcome to Autism Live on World Autism Awareness Day. Our very special guest this morning, as you can see right from the jump, is the fabulous and wonderful Dr. Temple Grandin. Dr. Grandin, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Well, it's really great to be here. Well, and I mentioned before we got started that uh, I wanted to take just a second at the top of the show to talk about World Autism Awareness Day, that this is a day that was created by the United Nations, and it is a day that asks all nations to step forward, to think about individuals who are on the autism spectrum and to find ways to bring the dignity of these individuals uh, together and to call nations to ask them to problem solve, to be able to get resources to these individuals and for them to be treated with the respect that they so richly deserve. Every year they have a special message to nations, a call to action about a specific thing. I don't know what they intended for this year's call to action to be, but it is in fact that individuals with the autism spectrum are treated fairly during this COVID emergency, that they do not lose resources that are vital to them, that they don't lose progress um, that was hard won and fought for them, and that they continue in this emergency to have access to medical care, uh, that there is consideration to get given to how they need to access the medical care um, and that they continue to have access to all of the things that a person, uh, any person has the right to, uh, you know, things that shelter, employment, education, all of those things. I think we can all agree how important that is. And, um, and I'm so excited because we have Dr. Grandin here today to be answering your questions live. I just wanna say that there are lots of ways to connect with us right now. If you're watching us on autism-live.com, then you know that there's a chat button at the very bottom. I'm monitoring what you guys write in. That's completely anonymous. We are also monitoring comments on Facebook and on YouTube and on Twitter. So you can be writing in on any of those right now. Um, I, Dr. Grandin, should I go ahead and jump in with a question that we okay. had? Okay. So, and of course, I'm going to, I'm going to find it here and I had it and then I don't know where it went. Uh, it was a question that we had about a four-year-old, a parent asking for how can we get our four-year-old to connect with us? And of course, of course, in this moment in time, I cannot find the actual report. Uh, hang on a second. I don't know where it is, but it was about a four-year-old. How do we get him to interact with us? And she said that she feels that he's, it seems like he's very in his own world and, and wanting to connect with him as much as possible as a four-year-old. Well, the first thing, I don't know whether this four-year-old can talk or not. Um, now, if this four-year-old can talk, you always want to give him an opportunity to use his words. Let's say you know he wants the juice. Instead of giving him the juice, quietly say to him, use your words. And then you've got to give him time to respond. These kids are sort of like a phone on maybe only one bar of surface. It takes time to load the web page or whatever. Give them time to respond. Always make opportunities to use your words. Another thing is engaging in little turn-taking games. Let's say he's uh, spinning a wheel on a toy car. Well, let's take turns spinning the wheel on the toy car. Turn it into a turn-taking game. No, no, I just, uh, I'm, I, I, I muted myself so that you, you could speak. Um, we had another question and you and I had talked about it briefly before we came on. It was a longer question. I'm going to consolidate it. Um, that uh, a mom wrote in, she's a mom with three kids. 
Two have other diagnoses. She's 37. She has Tourette syndrome. One of her children has uh, ADHD and another has autism, but they all exhibit some form of um, a sensory issue. They've all toe walked um, and they have these different issues. She says, we're all different, but we're the same. And she's wanting to know from you, uh, she suspects that even though her diagnosis is Tourette's and her daughter's is ADHD, she's wondering if maybe they also have autism to a lesser degree and what these three things might have in common. I wanted you to talk about that. uh, Research on Google Scholar. Now, Google Scholar is a scientific version of Google. And if you go on Google Scholar, you type in autism and ADHD, you're going to find, and genetics, you're going to find there's genetic crossover. There's also crossover in brain scans where some of the uh, features are the same. See, these diagnostic categories are not precise. It's not like a COVID test. And I want to make, say, a high quality COVID test done correctly. That will give you a definitive diagnosis. It's not precise. These categories have blurry boundaries. Sensory issues that those go, those happen in many different disorders, um, both developmental and head injuries. You also can get sensory issues. So their social awkwardness um, tends to go with a number of these different things. It's not real precise. Okay. Uh, We have a question specifically about the COVID-19 emergency. A parent writes in and says, what advice do you have for a 17-year-old on the spectrum who is having acute anxiety about COVID-19? And they want to know specifically, what has helped you with anxiety? I have researched every piece of scientific literature on on the shelf, in the pharmacy medications that might treat COVID. And even before Donald Trump talked about... um, hydroxychloroquine, I already had found that drug. So just knowing that there's things to possibly treat it. Now I want to emphasize a lot of stupid things have been done with drugs. Hoarding, it's totally bad. People need that drug for lupus. They need it for rheumatoid arthritis. Also, it's never to be used for prevention. It's to be used for moderate to severe COVID. Um, that, you know, all the tests haven't been done, but there are things to treat it. Computers right now are finding even more things. So that made me less afraid that there's actually some stuff to treat it. And also I've looked at the statistics. I am in the at-risk group. Um, I probably have a 4% chance of dying. Well, Ebola is a 30% chance. Another thing that put it in perspective for me is I fell five years ago in my my own bathtub. And a week later, I realized I had a dent here at the base of my skull. That bathtub came that close to killing me. The number didn't come up. I'm more worried about the bathtub. (laughs) <laughs> um, but they, the reason why everybody's got to stay in their homes is if everybody went out of their homes, well, the hospitals wouldn't even be able to treat people. You know, right now in New York, they're taking refrigerated trucks. I have to say that's something we use in my industry to haul food in and they're putting dead bodies in them. I you know that's really horrible. You know, you just would, if too many people got sick all at once, the hospitals cannot deal with that. There's yeah. a lot of things that have to be learned such as if you get COVID, how long do you stay immune? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Hopefully a long time. If there's a vaccine gets developed, is it going to uh, have to be a flu shot every year or will it be like one of the more permanent kinds of vaccine? I don't think people know at this point. Um, But I find that in my animal behavior research, if you turn on the seek emotion, that turns off fear. You might want to look at the Jack Penskep emotional systems in my book, um, Animals Make Us Human. And while I'm looking up all this information online, um, that made me less afraid because there are some things to treat it with and they need to learn how to use those things and they need to learn how to use them quickly um, because uh, we want to try to prevent people from going on respirators. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's everybody's entitled to a certain amount of anxiety about this, but oh, a yeah. lot of it is that there's so much of this that isn't in our control. But what I'm hearing you say is that you felt more in control when you did some research. I did some research and I found out that there now, now you've got doctors and dentists hoarding this drug. This is bad. Then you've got people that have lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. You see what that what these drugs do is they stop the, the horrible inflammation in the lungs. They put out the fire of inflammation. People with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis that can't get this drug. That is really bad. Yeah. You we know, need that, to be very that's considerate. Not okay. about it. No, it is not. Um, and somebody, Julie has written in and said, our 15-year-old hardly speaks, 
and spends way too much time in his room. He only comes out to eat, shower, and use the restroom. He refuses to go anywhere and refuses to cut his hair. With COVID-19, his so socialization has critically decreased. Uh, telecounseling starts next week, and they said help. Well, there's been, I've talked to several, two uh, boys that got totally addicted to video games. And one of the things that saved them, now I realize this would be hard to do now, is they got interested in fixing cars and doing robotics. And for one of the students, um, he's now fixing cars. Another one is fixing trains for the railroad. They found out that mechanics was more interesting than video games. Mm -hmm. So what we got to do is give him a replacement for whatever he's doing in his room. You have to replace it with something else. Now, and I, I, I like to make things. That's why I came up with this little book, uh, a little book, Calling All Minds. Um, it's all my childhood things to make. Some of these things, people could make things. We've got to figure out other stuff to do, but you have to replace the video game with something else. Now, and with all this stuff going on now with COVID, these games where people could talk to each other, a certain amount of that I think would be good. Five hours a day, no, but maybe an hour or so a day to um, you know, talk to their friends online. Um, but you have to replace it with something else. So, see, the first thing I'm gonna ask the parents, does this kid like to do anything else other than playing video games? I'm gonna assume that he's doing either that or movies or something like that constantly. Well, and we'll wait to see if she writes us back to tell us what other things he likes. You and I had an opportunity right before we came on live because she mentioned the telehealth um, to talk a little bit about telehealth. And because you were saying to me how important it was um, for the, the little kids uh, to continue to get their therapy. We yes, were talking absolutely. about absolutely. We were talking about how it is a medically necessary treatment. Absolutely. Um, and that when you can continue services in whatever way you can continue services, um, that it's advisable to do that. And we were sort of talking about telehealth and, um, and about, you know, you said something that I, I thought, thought was really interesting. I was telling you how impressed I am with parents, how parents have, have stepped up and said, you know, teach me how to do this. I want to know how to do this. And that they're sometimes being the facilitators while the therapist um, does therapy via telehealth. And, mm -hmm. and do you remember what you said, Temple? You said, well, I know these parents what, can- What the therapist can do is they can coach the parent over the video link on how to do the speech therapy, how to do the ABA. It's very important with the young children to do a lot of turn taking. That was a lot of emphasis on that. We can play board games and things like that. That is that stuff we could do. And they can coach the, um, uh, the parents on how to work with the child because we've got to keep working on speech. I don't want to lose, you know, months of, of uh, working on a kid to get them talking. Yeah, absolutely. We don't want to have any, we want to really minimize regression and see if we can continue on. But I was really uh, inspired when you said, because I said, you know, a lot of parents are afraid that they can't do it. And oh, you they said can't, they can't, they can't, <laughs> they can, but they need professional coaching. Okay, well, back yep. before COVID, people would ask me, they'd say, oh, well, our school does, you know, two hours of speech a week or something like that. And I said, well, that's not enough. But I said, what it is enough for is for that teacher to be a coach, to teach mm -hmm. you and teach some volunteers on how to work with your kid. And you need to look at that hour of therapy you get a week from the school as uh, they're your coach, because I definitely believe in professional guidance. And that can be done, you know, over the video. Uh, another thing that got brought up on distance education is whether there are enough devices. I mean, if the parents have a job online, they're gonna need a computer. Um, trying to do school on a phone is like completely atrocious. Um, yeah. You know, then if there's only one decent computer, then we're gonna have to take, figure out how to take turns on it. You know, this yeah. is where making a new schedule. I've read some, you know, the big NASA fan, you took me out to Houston, NASA. That was so much fun. It was really <laughs> fun. I'm a total NASA geek and you have to, um, on the space station, people have to live together. They need some alone time. They also have very structured work time. Uh, they have to not make messes in the bathroom and things like that. Um, you know, if there's only one computer, then we're gonna have to make a schedule on what on how it gets used. Yeah. You know, the yeah, in fact, that, we... and, and sometimes it depends what kind of work the parent has, then there's some stuff that will have to be done on a phone. But then we need to figure out which things 
need the big computer, the big screen. Yeah, I, I loved, because uh, you and I were reminiscing about that trip to NASA and, and talking about that, you know, because they took us into the, um, the model, the actual the size model, model of yeah, the space that station. That was really cool. Just it was what. so cool. But picturing people living in that small of a space and knowing that they can't go out to the store, um, like it really sets an example for us of how we have to live, we have, we have to cohabitate in, in a respectful way and, and that they take care of business every day. I know you were saying earlier this morning, keeping to that schedule, getting up every morning, getting, getting dressed, important. I'm making sure that I am dressed for work by eight. Not be slouching around in pajamas. I think that's important. And then if Absolutely. hopefully there's enough devices available, I'd for me, if I was doing courses online, I would, uh, I'd get my heavy duty schoolwork done in the morning or heavy duty report writing. If it's a, uh, let's say a parent, you're really uh, hard work where you got to think done in the morning when you're fresh, that's what works for me. And then you can do easier, easier uh, jobs in the afternoon, have time off. One thing they did learn on the space station is that they do have to, each astronaut has to have some alone time where he can talk in private on the laptop, you know, to, to the family, uh, watch a movie by himself. And then there's other activities that eat together. That's something they do together. And then you have to make sure that, you know, people when, before they go up there, get to pick what food they want. There's some choices. Well, somebody's got to not be taking somebody else's food. This is the sort of thing that would really cause a lot of friction on the space station. Well, one of the questions that we had come in early, Temple, was that somebody was asking, what is your preferred food during this COVID emergency? Like, what's the one food that you keep stockpiled in your house because you really can't do without it? Well, I really like some dark chocolate, but I've got to make sure people have given me a lot of that, that I'm, I'm really limiting how much of that I eat. I still am eating the same yogurt and fruit for breakfast. I have that. Um, fortunately, I've got people shopping for me, which I really appreciate. And it's been making me think about food in a different way. You know, and I most of the time they buy stuff I like, I've got bought some stuff I did not like, but I had to eat it, had to eat it. We cannot be wasting food when you've got people in that amazon warehouse or some other place that are getting it ready for you that every trip to the grocery store there's an exposure risk no you eat it absolutely you know, i've been there was some sliced uh, processed turkey that i really hate and i it's getting eaten there you go uh, a good you're, you're a good role model now we've got a couple of people who are writing in and letting you know that um that they themselves uh have had diagnoses a uh, one who says i got a, a light a late diagnosis, uh, what, uh, what services would you recommend uh, to help me cope? And another yeah, person- probably, Is this a teenager or an older adult? I, I, don't, I don't need to know the exact age, but I need to know am I dealing with a 10 year old, a teenager or an older adult? That's well, they're saying they got a late diagnosis. So I think you're talking about an actual adult. Well, there's a lot of people, we have a book, Different Not Less, which is 14 old uh, Asperger's or, or, or uh, people diagnosed on the spectrum later on in life. And where they found it really made a difference was with their relationships. You see, this is where, you know, I've, I've had, I had a lady come up to me in the Denver airport one time and she said, oh, now I understand my engineer husband after I read your book, uh, Thinking in Pictures. Now on the job front, I think some people are getting too overcoddled when they should be getting out and learning work skills because all the people in the different not less book had um, all had had jobs ranging from a tour guide at a history museum to IT and a medical doctor all different kinds of jobs I didn't just fill it up with the computer geeks and half of them are on the autism spectrum uh, out there in Silicon Valley I've been there they avoid the labels but Absolutely. the first step is realizing you know that you think uh, differently and for relationships that it's been a, a good thing for a lot of people. And that's why I did the different, not less book. And all of the people in that book are, are employed. Wonderful. I, I should point out that Temple has been prolific and written a lot of books that are really amazing resources. And you can find all of her books on Temple. Oh, They're available on Amazon. Look at that. New uh, edition at of the way I see it. Brand <laughs> new fifth edition of the way I, I see it. it a whole lot of little short articles. We updated it, um, uh, just came off the press about a week ago. Wonderful. And so people can go to templegrandon.com to get the books. 
Um, but they can, you can, they're also available on Amazon if you want to get, if you put it in your Amazon cart um, as part of your delivery. Now, Katie has written in and said, I have anxiety a lot. I, I have autism and ADHD and I'm worried a lot. How can I, how, um, how can you help me with my anxiety? And, but Katie does not say how old she is. Katie, well, this can is the you problem. tell us? She goes, well, I, I've been on antidepressant medication since my early thirties. Because as I went through my twenties, my anxiety got worse and worse and worse. I, my body was like in a constant state of fright. I remember telling Dustin Hoffman when he did Rain Man, Imagine how nervous you were when you did your first, your first interview to land that a big part like that. Well, that's the way I feel all the time. And in my book, Thinking in Pictures, I describe what it was like before and then taking antidepressants. I've worked with other people that are visual thinkers that are very, very anxious, and they've been able to remain employed by taking a low dose of Prozac. I'm taking one of the old fashioned drugs. The mistake that gets made with antidepressants when they're used for anxiety is too high a dose. Label doses are often way too high. They might have to take only half to three quarters of a label dose on some of these different drugs. But basically, antidepressants saved me. I don't think I would be here. And one of the things that happened with me is some of my stress-related health problems cleared up. The colitis I cleared up. But, you know, there's a place for medication. Now, way too many meds are given to little kids. That's why I wanted to know age. Now, I was a full-fledged adult when I took it. Okay. You know, my brain was now, you know, fully developed, but there's some people that are going to need a little help from biochemistry. And that's why the chapter is called a believer in biochemistry. The other thing that helps is exercise. I'm doing now modified push-ups every night. I was doing sit-ups, but my sciatic nerve acted up. So then I had to change that to um, modified push-ups. And what I do is a burst of hard exercise. And if I don't do that every night, I cannot sleep. So that needs to be something people get into their schedule and I had already developed exercises I could do in a hotel room. Um, you know, I had, I don't really like going to the gym in a hotel, something I could do in the room. And I want to warn you that the first time I did the sit-ups, I could do like two. You have to work up to it over, over several months. Um, but that's, those are things that helped me. The other thing is, is you some, there's a point where you just got to get out and do things. Mother always gave me a choice. When I was 15, I was afraid to go to my aunt's ranch. Mother gave me a choice. I could go for a week or I could go all summer. Not going, that wasn't gonna be one of the choices, but always choices, always choices. But there's a point where you, uh, I, I, I recommend reading that one chapter in particular on how I dealt with anxiety. And the thing that was weird is that when the colitis flared up, I was less anxious. It was really, really weird. Uh, interesting. But I don't think I'd have any insides left if I hadn't gone on the, on the medication. And I know other people professionally, visual thinkers, one that's definitely autistic, other two are definitely not autistic, where a little dose of Prozac kept them off the drugs and the alcohol. And they'd be okay. in the gutter if they weren't on the, uh, on the Prozac. Wow. Now, our mom who asked uh, before about the young man who was in his room all the time, the 15 year old, she has written back to us and she said that you were right. He is obsessed with video games. She says his school was creating a special project for him, uh, for, for him and a group to create a new sign for the school. With the school being closed, that is on hold. He loves art. We brought more than $200 in supplies at Christmas as a Christmas gift, but he has no interest in any of it, Temple. Well, you can still design a new school, a new sign for the school, uh, and, and you can display it online and show it to people. And, and you can still work on design stuff. You know, we're, this is still going on now. Like we're doing cattle stuff. Uh, Mark, my assistant's doing uh, cattle stuff and, and we can't go anywhere. We can't travel, but, but, uh, we're still doing design work. People write in to me about livestock stuff. We're still doing it. But Temple, how did your mother motivate you? I'm always amazed by the fact that your mother was so ahead of the curve. And you have told me before that if, if left to your own devices, you would have sat and spun the little metal plate at the end of your bed. And that's what you would have done all day long. How did your mom get you out of the bedroom, get you into the stalls with the horses, and then get you drawing horses? How did she well, get you I, to do drawing, that? Drawing horses I was doing in about third grade, because when I was in third grade, I would just um, uh, 
draw the same horse head over and over again. And she just suggested, well, let's draw the entire horse. So let's draw its saddle, draw its stable. Okay, you have a kid that loves cars. Well, let's look at different kinds of cars. In other words, take that fixation and broaden it so it's not quite so fixated. That, um, uh, that's what people need to be doing. Uh, you figure out how to broaden it. And then when I went away to the special boarding school, um, I loved riding the horses. And I got, um, I threw, um, still had some problems with anger. I had to turn anger to crying. That's how I got rid of anger. And, and uh, they took riding away for two weeks after I got in a fist fight in the cafeteria. And, you know, then I, we had remodeled the horse barn at our school and they suggested to start taking care of the horses. And I started doing it and liking it. You see, people have got to try stuff. You know, we've got to replace, give them a choice. You can do this art project or this. In other words, give them a choice of things to replace what you're doing. I was allowed to spin the little brass plate on my bed for an hour a day. Then we had to do something else. I could go outside and play with my kite, for example. Um, but we're going to do something else, but always give some choices. But the choice isn't going to be in your room all day, but you do have some downtime, do stuff like that. And they found they had to give the astronauts on the space station on an hour a day, which just uh, be their alone time. Uh, so many people are writing in so many wonderful things saying what a gift to have Temple's opinion and thank you. And um, a mom who has written in and said that you helped her so much that years ago you were able to be on the phone with her and that you helped to get her child to eat and that it was just a dream to be on the phone with you. Um, so just want to acknowledge that there's so much love being poured out to you right now. Well, I really um, appreciate that. Um, and I just want to, you know, this is a difficult time. I mean, I've had all my events are canceled for the next two months. Everything is canceled. I well, have uh, my last airplane trip. Last event was on March 11th. I got on a plane on the 12th. They had a faculty meeting the next day. They were going to close school. That was Friday the 13th. And we were told to get our classes online. Boom, like that. And how are you finding the online teaching? Because they're they're wanting to know what you think about this online teaching and what about the kids who are at home and don't have access to online curriculum, what your thoughts are about that. Well, then let's start with, do, are, are you enjoying the teaching online? It's different, right? Well, I miss the interaction. I've given my phone number to all the students. I'm begging them to, uh, to talk to me. Now it's totally ruined the labs for everybody because we were kicked out so quickly that we didn't, there was no way to videotape the labs. I'm not allowed to go to the experiment station. Mm -hmm. So that really is bad. Now, other parts of the class, the lectures, I had three of them already, um, already, uh, uh, already online. And we, the three others we put on a website that, that's used for the, for the university online learning. So the lectures are there. Um, they, I have a project where they have to do a, um, look up journal articles online on a subject that each student picks on animal behavior that interests them. That we can still do just fine. They're still gonna do the drawing project and then to turn it in, they're gonna to have to screen shoot it with their phone. Um, and so, and then I get on the chat board every afternoon and, and make replies. And, and so you're making it work. Um, so many- make it work. Right, and I had right. to learn how to use the stuff. I, 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 I had to get my students to teach me how to use it. And it's like, boom, you, know, you yeah. got to do this. For the parents that are home and have kiddos that are home that are on the spectrum that typically would have had an aid in the classroom and are now faced with the teacher being online and the, and the kiddos aren't responding well to it. Do you have any words of wisdom? Well, the thing is going to be really hard on the parents. The parents are going to have to be the aid. I don't know anything else to, to, to say. Now I would rec I'm recommending that we're gonna get up, we're gonna have, we're gonna not be in jammies, we're gonna get dressed for school, dressed for work. I think that applies to the whole family. And and let's get some of the serious school work done in the morning when you're not tired and cranky and save Absolutely. the easier stuff for the afternoon. Then we have a uh, then you have an hour where you can play your video game, and then you can we'll go walk the dog. Uh, then we do some exercises, maybe we get the uh, group exercises online or something, but make yeah. a new schedule the same way they do in the space station. They schedule their meals. They schedule when they have to do their experiments. 
but they also have scheduled downtime. Yeah, in fact, you can pretend that you're on the space station. Well, that's sort of like what it's like. Yeah, it's exactly what it's like. Um, and then for par parents, they're also wanting to know if there isn't anything online that's being offered, do you have any recommendations? Well, then for, you for better, I, I would go on some of the homeschooling websites and maybe buy some workbooks, buy some materials online. Uh, now, one of the problems that's happening with Amazon Warehouse now is they are going to may run out of books because they have to stock essentials. Uh, yeah. But well, the books are available electronically. So Absolutely. if you buy a Kindle or some other device like that, the, the, that I'm sure that's considered as essential. But um, um, no, you need to get some materials. Um, you know, I'd get on the homeschooling websites and I would try to find materials. And yeah. we're going we're gonna to have some classes. We're going to have to do have a time where we're going to do schoolwork, whether yeah. it's actually online or you're going to do it with some materials. Uh, there's tons of free stuff online. Let me tell you how to find some really cool mathematics stuff. Use <laughs> Google Images to search for mathematics stuff. You will find websites you will not find on, on regular Google. You want to see the cool patterns? Go to Google Images. Type in protein symmetry. Let the math kids go play with that. Uh, and you and I talked about this happens. last week and I've been having fun with it all week long. Uh, I, because I, when I called Temple to see if she was available to do this and she was like, are you near your computer? Look this up right now. And I said to you, I said, Temple, I'm, I'm looking at these beautiful pictures. Uh, what am I looking at? And do you remember what you said to me? Well, you're looking at things like the mitochondria of the cell that provide energy for your body to work. Yeah, you're but you said to me, you're looking at the art that is inside your body. That's right. That's and right. And that, that got me very it's excited. Very, about. very cool. And there's so many, uh, now for computer programming, there's um, scratch programming. There's a, a code.org. That's another thing. Coursera has a lot of free college classes. Now, if you want them for credit, you're going to have to pay. But there's a lot of free stuff online that you can do where, where you can... Um, take college classes online, really cool college classes. You Let's turned me on to Khan stuff. Academy. You're the Khan person. Khan Academy. Yeah, you, Khan is K-H-A-A, excuse me, K-H-A-N academy.org, you guys. And Temple was the first person to tell me about that. And they have curriculum line, uh, aligned information for everything from pre-K through 12. It's, a, it's an incredible, and actually above that. It's an incredible place. And you're the one who told me, and I got my son on there. It, was, it changed everything. It's a, and it's free. So you can't no, beat that. All this stuff I'm talking about is free. Okay. Some more questions here. Now that, uh, that adult who, that we were trying to figure out, he said he was diagnosed at 58. How exciting is that? And that he was nonverbal until he was five. Um, and that, so that was that person that we were talking to um, about things that could help resources that could help. Um, so it was an adult. Good. Um, another person is, says that they have a five-year-old who has good vocabulary, but how can I encourage him to talk? He's simply not interested to talk. He used to talk when he was below two years. Well, always make opportunities for talking. If he wants a food or he wants a toy, say, use your words and then give him time to respond. These, you know, you know, if, you, if the website doesn't come up right away and you're poking the mouse and stuff and then the computer just freezes. Well, that's the way these kids are. Uh, you've got, you might have to give them five seconds to respond. That's a long time if you time it. Um, but always have opportunities to use language. Okay, well, let's have some sit down meals now, like we used to have in the 50s, where, where if I put my fingers in the mashed potatoes, uh, mother would say, use the fork. If I reached across to grab the serving dish, uh, mother would say, ask your sister to pass it. Give the instruction. You know, then you might ask him what he did in, in uh, what he did on his online learning or a movie he looked at. In other words, each member of the family would tell something they did that day. I think this is one of the ways to get language going because uh, that's what they do at the space station. They eat together. Absolutely. Speaking of that, um, Angela wants to know about relationships. I have a 17 year old that doesn't have friends outside of school or sports. Not sure what to do. Is there a website that teens hang out on? Well, it's friends who shared interests. I mean, I've got friends and there are people where we, we do cattle stuff together or it's animal behavior or it's autism stuff where it's a shared 
interest, a robotics side, of course, when school is going, things like art, robotics, choir, all the things we can't do now, um, those are things that would be a shared interest. You know, I, I, fixing cars, I, I, I had friends that, you know, that built equipment. Those are things that are a shared interest. Yeah, you know, they've actually, there was a study that was done years ago about how to make kids uh, bully proof, how to get them to be less bullied by their peers. And what they found was that if they created a club after school, and it could literally be that kid creating a club about their interest, that it attracted other people to whatever their interest was. And then they formed a pack and they were less likely to be picked on all of them. Well, and I sort of thought that was fascinating. That's a good idea because the only places I was not bullied in high school was on um, horseback riding, model rockets, things where there was a shared interest. Now, fortunately, when I was in elementary school, I went to a very small elementary school, really small little classes. And, and uh, the teacher explained to the other students that I had a disability that didn't show like crutches or a wheelchair mm -hmm. and that the other kids need to be helping me. And that has a fancy name. It's called peer mediated intervention. And you can, I do have a free paper online. It's called um, how um, horses, um, uh, horse, uh, how horses um, help a teen with autism to make friends and learn how to work. Mm -hmm. Type that title okay. into Google, you can find it. Okay. Uh, you mentioned before that you got into trouble at school because you got angry and that you learned to deal with the anger through crying. I'm always fascinated though, what made you angry? Like, why did you punch that person in oh, the- they, 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 they had bullied me. They had called me names. They, they had bullied me. That's, that was the reason. And, and I, I had to switch from anger to crying. And another thing with NASA, I went to a really sad thing where when this, they had on 60 minutes when the space shuttle got canceled, um, these NASA space scientists were crying. And that's one of the reasons why they still have their jobs because they were throwing tools. NASA would have fired them for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's better to cry. Bunny wants to know, I just picked up my son who has, is nine year old and has ASD and is semi-verbal, his learning materials. It's a big box of materials and I have no idea or how long to work. I'm on the spectrum as well. So I need directions. Well, some kids can, you know, concentrate longer than others. You know, they, you, some kids are really hyperactive. You got to do a little bit of learning and then give them breaks. It's going to depend upon the, the kid. And there's others that can knuckle down and, you know, put a bunch of work out. I think another thing that might help with the kid is let him have some choices of which things we do first. So he has some control over the environment. We're going to get the school work done, but we can have some choice of when we do some of the different activities and, and I, uh, you know, some kids can do a lot of work at one time. Other kids need breaks. They need sensory breaks. I think one of the worst things schools did was uh, taking out recess. Another thing that schools did that was really bad was um, getting, taking out hands-on classes. If I had not had sewing and woodworking and art, I would have hated elementary school. So let's work well, craft projects. And of course, I'll, here's my book on the things I used to like to do as a kid, Calling All Minds. And, and uh, I, you know, making things. Maybe we can work math into making things. You know, we can absolutely. think of creative ways to do things. I'm finding right now the day that we've got graduate, I've got graduate students right now, awful writing skills. They don't know how to like sort of frame an argument for something. And the reason why they're so bad is they never had to write book reports and they never um, uh, had anybody mark up the work and then they had to go back and correct it. And this is something that's gotten really bad in the last five years. And I'm not the only professor that's been complaining about this problem. Well, and, and the thing is, is that this period of time, you know, regardless of whether we wanted it or not, we are, we are forced to have this opportunity where we could do all kinds of things. So maybe at school, they're not going to stop and have a break and teach sewing, but we absolutely can do you that. You can do that. You can we absolutely work can. Up. You can do it like a lot of older people. I'd rather just get a big slug of it done in the morning, but there may be yeah. another kid where you do a little 15 minutes of work and then you do something else and it's spread out through all the day. Yeah. Uh, you now, the, but it needs to eventually, you got to figure out some kind of a schedule where. Absolutely. Going. Now, Alexis has written in and said, because we were talking about video games before, they said a lot of video games aren't a problem. Get the kid to learn how to, they mean, uh, le learn how to. 
They may either, um, for videos that teach people how to play or teach them how to run massive multiplier games. Now, Temple, I'm wondering, have you seen any of the games that are VR? Have you done the thing where you put the- uh, I haven't, I've done, I've done virtual reality. I haven't done it in a video game, but I've done it in just a demonstration. They, they have, have ones that teach job skills. Well, and that- And they make it fun. Well, that's good. Some of that stuff would be good. Like maybe yeah. it, it's a video game of a, how to interact with customers in a store. Yeah. You know, that's something that could be helpful. You see, there's a lot of things you can learn from video games, but Absolutely. that's an hour a day of doing it. Okay. Eye hand coordination, some problem solving. So that's one hour a day of doing it, not five or six hours a day. The benefits okay. you would get in one hour. Now, Nikki has written in on Facebook and she wants to know what coping skills can I use uh, when our internet or cable goes out, my autistic son beats himself, attacks others till it's fixed. I've tried social stories, uh, a box of things he enjoys to keep him busy, but it doesn't work. He even goes so far as pulling his own hair out, please. How to help with his anxiety about cable and internet connection not working. Thanks. Uh, she says, this is a major problem. Well, one of the things we, first of all, let's try to work on getting him to do some other things where he's not so dependent on the internet connection. Does he have a dog? Are there, does he, would he like to learn how to cook? Would he like to um, learn how to do some hands-on thing? I'd like to try to get less dependency on the internet, that there's other things that you can do. And, Absolutely. and uh, you know, now some, there's still, if you have DVDs around, you can have some DVDs that you could play. You can probably can buy a DVD player online so that you've got some movies stored. So when the cloud crashes, you could still um, uh, have things to do. You see, the problem is the internet circuits are getting overloaded. Yes, it's it is. I'm, I keep, you know, keeping my fingers crossed that we get to get this live feed out. But I also want to put a plug in for those of you who are having ABA with your kiddos and you're doing that telehealth piece that Temple was talking about before where they're coaching you. This would be sort of an ideal thing to ask for coaching on from your ABA professional to help you to set up parameters and an intervention so that you, you know, that you knew what to do when it was happening and you knew what to do before it was happening. Um, you know, I just want to throw that two cents well, in. Well, I'd like I, to try to work with this kid to have less dependency on the internet. Absolutely. And, and let's start working on gradually getting them to do some other things that have nothing to do with a screen so that screens aren't his whole entire life. And yes. you're going to have to do that gradually and give them some choices. You know, so the internet is going to go down. That's yeah. going to happen. It is going to happen. Uh, Manuel wants to know, my daughter is nonverbal and very hyperactive. She's nine years old. What would you recommend to help her? And they, and he says, it's a pleasure watching you both live. It's a pleasure being here with you. And I don't know about you. I got so excited about seeing Temple's Kitchen. That was a, that was a big, you know, woohoo well, for me a, today. I read a really, really funny uh, thing online that some employees, you know, has this big, huge, super important vice president boss and he couldn't get away from looking at the guy's kitchen cabinets right. and i read that on a thing about um uh, you know working online <laughs> they just couldn't imagine this big vice president might even have <laughs> kitchen cabinets right oh, i'm like well, temple there are things people have right there are things on your refrigerator and before this is done i need to know what things are on your refrigerator well, it's exciting a, to me there's a bison on there and there's a cute little puppy on there then there's uh, some little magnets that were given to me of some artwork. Well, fabulous. That's but now definitely. back to the nonverbal, very hyperactive nine-year-old. What would you recommend, Temple? Well, let's try to work on things where he can, he can mother you say, run the energy out of you. Okay. And it's a girl. It's a daughter. Exercise things, some sensory things. Um, you know, his mother says, run the energy out of you. So we got to try to figure out some things that he can do. I don't know if he lives in an apartment or what he lives in. Um, yeah. You know, this, uh, but he's going to have to have the other thing I'm going to ask is what was he doing before COVID? What kind of situation was he in? Was he in? You see, this is where I got to have more, more information and how well was he functioning in his previous situation? Yes, it is a girl. He mentioned that it's his oh, daughter. Right. Girl. But okay. um, one of the things we've been talking about on the show is that even for people who are in apartment buildings, I just keep remembering Temple back to when I was a young girl. And we didn't have the internet. And a lot of times we got snowed in for days on end because I lived in upstate New oh, York. Oh, we play in the snow. 
Oh, right. We went out and played in the snows. And then I was taught turn taking where I'd roll the bottom ball of the snowman. My sister would ride, do the middle ball. Then I would do the head. And then we had a box of old junk, the snowman decoration box. And it just had silly things in it, like hats and scarves and, and things like old pill bottles. We'd use those for eyes. It was Wonderful. Just, just now, but, of course, there were no pills in those bottles, empty pill bottles. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but there was also a lot of time when we were kids that we had to be stuck indoors. And we would make an obstacle course in the living room. And we would create ways that, and my mom would help us to create ways that we could get our yayas out. That's what we always called it. So even if you can't go outside, you can't get to a park, you don't have any place to take your kids, but you're in your apartment, turn your apartment into an obstacle course and make them run the obstacle course. Kids need exercise. Well, we used uh, to play horses when I was a kid. And since I was big and strong, I, I, I was always the horse. Somebody, somebody <laughs> light on ride me, but that, you know, and then we had a brown rug in our TV room. That was the, that was the corrals. And then the living room was the pasture because they had a green rug and i that takes up a lot of energy. And, and that kind of play, it, yeah. it, like it actually requires a lot of cognition. It helps you to um, work on all the different kinds of plays that there are of, of taking something and endowing it with other uh, qualities, doing imaginary play, doing sociodramatic play. And it's really good for our kids. So, um, you know, it's really important, especially for those hyperactive kids to be able to have a way to move their body um, even, you know, we were recommending the other day, rearrange your furniture, like push the furniture around, push it back to where it was, but that pushing kind yeah, of thing right. activates work. heavy work. Exactly. Um, so good uh, for that. Uh, also, okay. also, if you've got an OT that you could get on tele a teleconference, um, you know, could give you, give you some coaching and that might be helpful. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, another question here. Good morning. Have a question. What do you do when your son doesn't want to be with another person? My son doesn't want to be with my little girl. And, and you were talking about if we had two astronauts that didn't like each other, how would, how would we help them to work this out? Well, probably be spending some time apart opposite ends of the space station. Oh, and there's been problems where, where on one of the, uh, one of the, not the U.S. space station, but a Russian space station, they felt they were overworked and they turned off the communications and mission control. <laughs> and, <laughs> and though it wasn't the, the best thing to be doing. But now some um, people on the spectrum have problems with the high pitched, like a baby's cry, the voice, you know, could that be, be the issue? You know, what? sometimes it's sensory when it, if I get asked all the time about autistic people and animals. And what I say is there's three ways that they react to animals, love them, scared at first, then love them. And then ones where it won't work because they never know when the dog's going to bark because you can't control the dog and then it hurts their ears. Now, other sounds that you can control like the vacuum cleaner or uh, uh, maybe uh, some other hair dryer or something like that. If the child can turn it on and control it, that can often be really helpful where they turn it on and off, they might get to like the vacuum cleaner, but you can't control a little sister screaming or whatever. And may, you know, if it's sound sensitivity, well, then you can wear a headset then when she's around, but you can't wear a headset all the time. It will make your ear more sensitive, but you have it with you all the time, but you want to try not to wear it again, give them control, but I got to find out why he doesn't like his little sister. And sometimes things like that are sensory based. Now, I don't know. I don't, I'd have to ask a lot more questions. Okay. Um, another question, Dr. Grannon, I have a son who is 10. He loves to build cages for animals. It is all he wants to do. How can I fo foster this interest, but still get him to do his schoolwork? Well, we can have a time to do his building things and then has to be a time for doing schoolwork. We might give him some choices of the times on the schedule, but you are going to have to do some schoolwork. Absolutely. And the other thing I might do, if you could get the teacher on the phone or something and, and, and ask for help, I think a lot of these teachers would be available by phone and, and maybe the teacher can give you some ideas. Absolutely. Katie wants to know, have you heard about the cholesterol study at OSU that's carnitine cholesterol absorption issues, uh, talking about regressives, mitochondrial disorders, and apraxia. And she wants to know if you know anything about that. I would recommend you go to Google Scholar and look things up. Now I know okay. myself, I have to eat a certain amount of meat. There's no way I could be a vegan. My mother's the same way. I, we got to eat a certain amount of meat. I think there are differences in metabolism, 
but I would recommend doing Google Scholar search uh, to look that stuff up. And how do you get on Google Scholar? Type Scholar into Google, click it. You'll see a link that says Google Scholar, click on that. That will give you a new search box uh, that takes you into the scientific literature. Wonderful. I love this question. Temple, you are so awesome. I want to know what you were doing with your free time during COVID-19. Are you watching Netflix too? And what are you watching? Well, I've just started watching the new Star Trek Picard show. I love it. I yeah. just love it. And <laughs> I'm, I'm, but I'm not binge watching it. Okay. I think, it, you know, how about one episode a day? Right. And then maybe do some other show. You see, I think we need to get a more, you know, restrained schedule here. And so and that I have to watch the whole thing. Right. Well, I happen to know that that show is on, uh, it's on CBS access only. So, it, uh, you know, and, and for a while, it, it only comes out once a week. So, uh, but, then, but, then, but they, but then they leave the episodes online. Yes. Because so if I, you're just I, starting I, now, you've got like what, six, seven episodes. That well, you that's can right. Watch. And you can start watching those. Yes. And uh, Amazon does have it. Um, they uh, you can get it that way too. Have you uh, have you had a, the opportunity to meet Patrick Stewart? Never have met Patrick Stewart, but I did have the opportunity one time to meet Leonard Nimoy. Oh, I yeah. bet that was super cool. Yeah, that was. Now I've not met. Uh, I did not have the opportunity while he was alive to meet uh, Leonard Nimoy, but I I have met Patrick Stewart. He would probably think you were the. The most fabulous thing well, I ever. I loved um, Mr. Spock and I love Data because I yes. really related to those characters because they're like an autistic person. Yes. Like, there's a lot of subtle emotional things that I still don't pick up. Now, and, are you but, watching? There's a lot of things on television right now, Temple, where they're featuring characters who are on the autism spectrum. Are you there? Are you watching any of those? The doctor show. I have. Uh, I've seen that. Uh, yeah. Uh, now the thing is, a person with autism as they get more and more, uh, do more and more stuff to start to learn and, yeah. and learn, you know, what gets people upset and things like that. But I still have got, you know, I have problems because I tend to be very, very logical. And I found that looking up online, you know, medications that could treat COVID, that greatly reduced the fear. I remember when I first found some of the drugs, I'm going, wait a minute, I'm not going to die. You know, there are some things to treat it with. Yeah. And that's a very healing thought. Um, Navnet wants to know, my son does not speak and was diagnosed with autism when he was 1.8 years old. He is now 5.5 years old. What can we do to make him speak? We feel that he understands, takes us to what he wants, points fingers, murmurs some voices, kinds of words, I mean, what was um, but doesn't again? speak. Uh, he's five and a half now. Now, the thing I want to ask at five and a half, are you getting any words at all? See, this is what I want, more information. There are some kids that aren't going to learn to speak and, and they remain nonverbal. And there's some really good books to read. And one of my favorites is uh, Tito Makapadahe, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? That's Tito Makapadahe, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? And he's in a sensory disordered world. And then there's the sequel to the reason I jump. And I like the sequel. It's got something like fall down five times, get up six times. It's got a weird title like that. And he talks about not being able to control his movements. Uh, and so they, now we got to give him a way to communicate if, uh, if he's not talking at all. And maybe we need to introduce typing. Tito yeah. and Nomi, both uh, Noki, both uh, type independently, completely independently. And I'm... Um, if you were, we've got kids that remain nonverbal, I think those two books are absolute must reads written by, by people on the spectrum. Yeah. Everybody that we know that, um, what, that is nonverbal, um, that wasn't speaking as a child, and then has been given a device or given a method to have functional communication, they all say the same thing. They say how important it is to give children a way to communicate. I agree. And, and that it's different. I mean, you know, I, I guess there's preferences, you know, um, in the ABA world, they don't necessarily recommend having sign language be the preferred mo mo modem of communicating because so many of us don't know sign language. That's right. I would, I would agree with that, but on the, but some way to communicate. And there's some people that can type completely independently. There are others that can yep. use communication devices, but I can remember the frustration of not being able to communicate and just screaming. And in one of my very first book, Emergence Labeled Autistic, mother was taking me to the speech therapist and 
I didn't want to wear this hat, so I chucked it out the window of the car, and she tried to grab it, and we got hit by, you know, sideswiped by a semi-trailer. He swerved Ooh. off the road to save us hey. at, because I didn't want to wear this stupid hat. You see, that is frustration with not being able to communicate. It is a huge frustration. Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're running out of time. I'm going to ask one last question. Temple, you are the best. I am crying watching this. How can I find my son's special interest? Well, I need to start asking a bunch of questions. Um, that, you know, you know, if it, maybe it's a video game. Well, what's a video game about? Um, what's his favorite toys? I don't even know his age. Yeah. You know, the other thing that's really important on interests. I got interested in cattle when I was 15, when I was introduced to them on my aunt's ranch. So what this shows is that an interest can happen by introducing different things. Mm -hmm. And this is really important on careers. And I think uh, learning how to work is really important. But I got introduced to cattle. Um, and then you find out you like them. Or maybe you get introduced to something, you find out you don't like it. That's important too. Yeah. But we need to be introducing uh, kids to more things. I would have to ask a lot more questions. I don't know the age of him. I don't know how verbal he is. I don't know what's his favorite subject in school. I'll often ask that question. Well, maybe we can get an interest there. Wonderful. All right. Well, and I don't know if they'll have time to write in, but I, I wanted before we, I, got, I, I need to remind some people about things that are happening on the show, but uh, before we leave, I want to ask about your mom. How is your mom doing? Well, she's doing, and we got some groceries sent to her. She Good. said she didn't need them, but she's done. She walks every day. She said she's got to keep walking. She's 93 years old, and she's got to um, got to keep walking, and she's doing, uh, she's doing really well. Good. I'm so glad to hear that. For so many of us, we all look up to you, Temple, and think that you are incredible, but for a lot of us moms, we also... You know, we try to follow in your mom's footsteps because look at what a great jo job well, she mother did. Mother had a very good sense of how to push me. You got to stretch these kids. You don't chuck them in the deep end of the pool, but she had stretch and give choices. Stretch just outside the comfort zone. She had a really good instinct on exactly how much to stress to stretch me and give me choices. Like when I went to my aunt's ranch, I could stay for a week or stay all summer. Not going wasn't one of the choices. But yeah. I did have the choice that if I got too stressed out, I could come back. I got out there and I loved it. And yeah. I'm finding kids where he goes to maybe a sleepaway camp or something like that. And then he finds out he likes it. Um, no, yeah. we got to get him doing things. Now we're going to have to figure out how to do things like now inside your own space station. That's right. Yeah. Well, you've always pushed me with my son. Um, my son has always appreciated. Uh, you probably don't remember, but years ago, we were in a restaurant together, a barbecue restaurant, and my son was, my goodness, he was probably 11, and he was complaining about the fact that I was not letting him go to the restroom by himself and that I would take him in the women's bathroom. Oh, and you, you read me the riot act, and we were in the restaurant with my son, and you made me stop right there. You talked him through the whole thing, and you Bill, made Bill, me what sit I ended there. Up doing? I waited until the end of the meal. Yes, okay, we had the whole meal, like for maybe 20 minutes or so. And at the end <laughs> of the meal, I just casually said, OK, it's time to use the men's room. Yes. And he got up and he used it and he had to ask the waiter where it was because I could see uh, I was facing towards where the restrooms were. You were back to them. And he, yeah. went, he successfully used the uh, men's room. Yes, and I didn't. I didn't tell him at the end of the meal, you're going to use the, me the men's room. No. I just casually said, OK, it's time for you to go use it. Yeah. And you, and you made me sit there and, <laughs> and you talked me through it while he was in there and you told me he was going to be okay. And you told me you have to stretch him, mom. You have to let that, those apron strings go further because he needs it and he's ready for it. And it, it was and a barbecue restaurant. It was like one thirty, two o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. And yep. there was, there was nobody else would have been in that restroom. It wasn't busy. I could see the door and then see him come out yep. and, and he did it. Yep, he did. And all because you talked me through it. Uh, and I appreciate that still to this day. And he does. He's like, you know, temples on my side. <laughs> I get to use the men's room. 
All right, we are we are about to be out of time, but I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. And honestly, Temple, if you have more free time over the next couple of months, we're happy to have you back whenever you want. Okay, don't you have me back at, at uh, you know at five o'clock my time in Colorado? Yes, we have you back uh, later on today for a very specific group um, today uh, that it's just a group for parents and and thrilled to have you then. But I, if you want to be back on Autism Live, where we will make ourselves available whenever you want to well, do I this. Probably, you know, this I'll probably be happy to do that. You know, uh, well. Wonderful. A couple of programming notes that I want to tell you guys. We are back tomorrow with Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy and our very special guest on the show tomorrow is Danny Bowman. She is, and actually you have met her, Temple. She's a okay. remarkable young woman in her 20s on the autism spectrum, brilliant artist, has her cool. own animation um, studio, and she teaches animation to individuals on the spectrum. And she's cool. offering a very special online class right now that's good. free well, and she's going to tell us about that so um wonderful and then we've got great programming for you next week i want to i want to let you guys know that a week from tomorrow uh we're going to have julie matthews from nourishing hope there's another person that you know temple um that you've done things with julie matthews before and she um is getting ready to do a big summit that's online uh, towards the end of this month that i think you're all going to want to know about because it's about the food that we eat and how it affects us and how it affects our kiddos and what foods we can do to keep the, what things we can do to keep our food supply, even in this emergency, as clean as possible so that our kids have healthy guts, which then helps them. And I know that that's something that you, you, you know, you're very interested in as well, Temple. Uh, we all got to be healthy. And you were talking about the food supply, right? Well, I'd say we've got people out there, you know, truck drivers, we need to be thanking them, people that work in these warehouses, Absolutely. because you have the Amazon warehouse, but but you take Walmart, uh, Wal uh, Walmart has a warehouse, Target has a warehouse, all the grocery stores, they have these big distribution centers, huge supply chains that people um, have to work in to get that food into that store. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Julie's going to be talking with us a week from tomorrow. We've got great guests all next week, including Dr. Doreen Grampiche on Wednesday um, here answering your questions. Uh, but we're we're a little bit past time. We have to let Temple go. She's got I've lunch. Got another appointment, so I'm going to have to go. Temple, it's been such a pleasure. I'm going to talk to you later on today. OK, great. Wonderful to all talk right. to you. I'm going to sign off now. All right. Thank you okay. so much. And I'm going to sign off too. We're going to be back tomorrow with Danny Bowman and let's talk autism with Shannon and Nancy. Until then, give your kiddos a hug for me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>
you know, and that's just one step beyond turn taking in board games. You've got to learn to get your turn. Sometimes you get to pick out the movie, and other times uh, brother or sister may pick out the movie we go to. Well, one of my really important teachers, Mr. Carlock, my science teacher, and he had interesting projects for me to do. And I worked on all kinds of stuff with optical illusions. And that actually helped me in some of my cattle work because it made me pay attention to what the animals were seeing. And then that was uh, that doing interesting science projects got me motivated to study because now I had a reason for studying. Studying was a way to get to a goal of becoming a scientist. This is where a good teacher really turned the student around. Well, there's a lot of problems in the sensory system. Distorted input, sort of like uh, pictures pixelating with a bad satellite dish, uh, uh, audio cutting in and out like a really bad cell phone. Uh, a lot of the sensory systems are not working normally. In my book, The Autistic Brain, I've got a whole big section in there on sensory issues. And there's an interesting new study that's come out called Environmental Enrichment is an Effective Treatment for Autism. Now, I want to make it very clear, this does not replace ABA or speech therapy. It is an adjunct. And what's done in this, and there's a paper you can get online called Environmental Enrichment's Effective Treatment for Autism. You stimulate two senses at the same time, like maybe you do an aromatherapy, a cinnamon, something like that, touch carpet. You always change, always changing the pair of senses that you stimulate. And one of the senses is always one of the more primitive senses, smell, touch, or balance. So there's a lot of emphasis on eight different aromatherapies, and the people were, um, children were, were uh, evaluated baseline. Controls got ABA and speech therapy. Experimentals got this additional sensory therapy. And then after uh, quite a few months, they evaluated them again. And the experimental group that had the treatment had significantly better behavior. This is a refereed scientific journal article. And it uses simple household things, very simple to do. Environmental enrichment is an effective treatment for autism. You can download it online. I'll tell you some things not to do. Don't say you went to sleep, because then the child might be afraid that you went to sleep. I, when I was very young, uh, we were out for a walk and came across a very flat squirrel in the middle of the road that had been run over. And it was very clear that the squirrel could not be put back together again. And that made me learn not to run out in the street because I wouldn't want to be like that squirrel. And there's no way the veteran, veterinarian could do surgery and put him back together again. I mean, basically, um, you know, death of a person, they are gone. They are gone. Well, I, Oliver Sacks is a very kindly uh, kind of professor type of person. And I... Uh, I read an article he wrote in the New York Times just before he died about you know going back doing the Jewish Sabbath, and at the end of the article he was talking about well, if A then B then C, which way of his life could have gone down different paths? And I started really weeping when I read that article, you know, and I'm glad it went down the path that you know where our paths crossed. I could barely print it out. I was so um, upset. No, uh, fortunately, um, he was writing right up until the end. And he's uh, overall really satisfied with his life. Well, after the article appeared in the New Yorker magazine, uh, shortly after that, an agent uh, appeared that suggested that I ought to write a book. And that's what brought the book Thinking in Pictures into being. Welcome to Autism Live. We have a very special guest on the phone this morning, as promised, where we have Temple Grandin on the phone with us. First of all, Temple, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good. I understand that you had a great deal of snow this morning. Well, we had a horrible amount of snow um, last night. I gave a talk over in Greeley at the um, educational college, and the roads were just horrible coming back home. <sighs> wow. Uh, it's not supposed to happen at this time of the month uh, in April, is it? In the beginning of April, maybe, but 
craziness. Well, Temple, we have so many questions for you. It's kind of overwhelming. We, we put out a call to parents asking if there was anything that they wanted to ask you and individuals who are on the spectrum. And we have so many questions. Uh, there's no way that we're going to get through all of them, but I want to get to as many as possible. So if it's okay well, with why you. Why don't you try to pick out the questions where people may have had the same question, you know, for yes. several different people. And I and I've tried I've tried to do that in a couple of different uh, things. Starting with the first question is, what was the most difficult thing that you've had to overcome during your teenage years, and how did you overcome it? Oh, teasing and bullying absolutely was absolutely the worst. And the only place where I was not teased and bullied was when I was horseback riding or doing model rocket club or doing um, electronics lab. Those specialized interests were refuges away from teasing. Now, one of the problems we have today is, is today, if I had been out riding, they would have been texting me all kinds yeah. of horrible stuff like tape recorder and workhorse. Those are some of the names that they called me. Yeah. Teasing was the worst possible thing. I can't emphasize enough the importance of getting these kids involved with shared interests, you know, like electronics, school play, band, because those can be refuges from teasing. Okay, absolutely wonderful question. Uh, this is a great question that came in from a viewer. What do autistic people pay attention to when they were co are communicating with other people? Well, when I was young, I didn't even know about all the little subtle eye signals. I didn't even know they existed mm. until I read about them in a book when I was 50 years old. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's sort of like not knowing the language. Now, today, there's so many educational materials that... Um, can teach people those things. Absolutely. But for younger kids, when when you were younger and you didn't know about those things, what kinds of things did you pay attention to? Well, I could knew if somebody was laughing out loud or if somebody was mad. Uh -huh. I certainly understood that. It was the subtle things that I did not understand. Yeah. Interesting. Was there something though, did you were you somebody who looked at people's faces or uh, did you just listen to the tone of their voice before you knew about those subtle things? Well, the only subtle sign that I picked up was tone of voice. Okay. And when I was getting my business started, I would sometimes call up clients, and if they had a little whine in their voice, then I knew that maybe they weren't happy with me. Mm. And that's a subtle signal that animals pick up. Um, you know, if you went up to your dog and you went, you're a horrible dog. And you said it like that, he'd wag his tail. Yes. Because he's going to be cueing in to the tone of voice. Right. It, very fascinating. Okay, so tone of voice then is probably really important, especially when you're working with younger kids. Yes. Okay, interesting. All right, a little bit more specific question here. My five-year-old is high-functioning autistic. When he gets agitated, for example, his sister ta uh, takes his toy, he thumps himself in his head and his face. What can I do to make him use his words? And they wrote, P.S., your life story was an awakening for me. I understood my boy so much more, so thank you. Well, that's, that's really good. I'm glad that they understood him better. One of the things we've got to do is teach kids about turn-taking. Because I was reading some research where, you know, where some of the executive function problems can be improved with uh, the kid has to learn how to inhibit a response. Mm -hmm. And I was taught turn-taking with the Parcheesi board. Also, I had to learn that you've got to give those dice a fair shake. And, and um, I was always encouraged to speak. Um, but I think working on activities where he has to inhibit a response will help on this. Absolutely. I think, and I think board games are absolutely great. I'm a fan of board games, too. We taught my son so many different life skills using board games, yeah. and, it, and it was very reinforcing. They really helped me. Well, that's, and Parcheesi was your favorite one? Well, you see, right after the war, you know, when I was two and a half years old, the children's board games just did not exist. Oh. And so Chinese, the checkers was too hard, and so my mother got the two easiest grown-up games, and they were Parcheesi and Chinese checkers that you play with the marbles. Right. And the Parcheesi board was the main board game that was used with me when I was very, very young. Wow. Do you still play board games, Temple? No, I don't now, but I really recommend them for little kids. The other thing is, back in the 50s, things that were really fun, you had to do with other kids. Because when I was a little older, I got a table hockey set, mm. and that was my favorite thing. But you have to play that with somebody else. Yeah. 
That's a really good point because a lot of games now, kids get to isolate with computer games and things and be by themselves. Even if they're chatting with somebody else, they're very isolated while they're doing it. Well, I think we've got to be doing more activities involving turn-taking and playing with other kids in the real world. Uh, now, something like a Wii. Okay, if you do tennis doubles on the Wii, yes. you know, that is doing something. So I'm not anti-technology. Right. So let's do things where the kids have to interact in real life. It could be with an electronic game. You can get electronic Scrabble now. You can play that, yeah. um, you know, in, in real, it, with two kids playing it on electronic on a phone. Yes. But I want the kids interacting in the real world together. They have got to learn those social skills. Absolutely. And if you use an electronic device, fine. But I, I want them... I want them taking turns with that thing that's on the phone. Okay, great. Interesting that you brought up technology because our next question was about getting equipment and technology and finding funding for it. And they wanted to know if you're aware of any grants or insurance that would help to cover that. We're looking for an iPad since it has apps that can help with speech issues and task management. Well, one of the things now is old iPads can probably be yes. bought very, very cheaply on eBay. The iPad 1 is going to work just fine. Now, I know the Pro Logo to Go is, is kind of pricey, but I think if you look around, you can find other apps that are free. Yes. Um, uh, also, uh, for older kids and high-functioning kids, is fabulous free college courses online. Yes. Things like Coursera, edX, um, and uh, Udacity, and uh, Khan Academy. Absolutely. You gave me some great advice about that for my son. We actually wrote a blog about it on our site, listing those, all those things that you had told me for my son. If people are interested, they can go to our blog to find that. Um, how, many, how many hits did you get on that stuff? You know what? I, that's a really good question, and I'll have to look that up for you, because uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but um, I will find that out and let you know, Temple, because uh, well, it was really good information. Yes, because it's... Okay, a, let's do some more questions. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we had a lot of questions about sensory issues. One in particular, my nine-year-old has a lot of sensory issues that cause her to flap her hands and jump up and down when she's excited. Is there a way we can help her to control the uh, these overstimulations? Well, I think working with an OT, there's a number of different sensory activities that can help reduce this, things like deep pressure, slow swinging. Another thing that helps is just heavy work. I think one of the reasons why I liked cleaning the horse stall so much when I was 15 is that the heavy work helped to um, calm down my nerves. Interesting. And um, lots of exercise also helps. Um, other things, uh, fish oil supplements. I've been taking some B6 and uh, magnesium that I just buy over at Whole Foods and that's been, um, that, that's been helpful for me. I get the blue bonnet um, B100s. Um, let's get 10 tons of sugar out of the diet. Yeah. And I found myself, I've got to have some animal protein in the morning. Otherwise, I just cannot function. Interesting. And, but um, work with a good OT that's trained in sensory activities. <clears throat> also, what was done with me, I was allowed to have an hour after lunch where I could just veg out and spin things. Mm. But then there were other places where it was not allowed, like the dinner table or in the classroom. But some of these kids need to have sensory breaks where they can do a calming activity. And one of the reasons uh, some kids uh, do these behaviors is that they are calming. Yeah. But the problem, you let the kid do it all day, his mind's not going to develop. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's super duper advice. We actually, you had uh, talked the last time we talked with you about uh, limiting the amount of time that they could stim, and we've had several parents write in and said uh, they've said how effective that has been working with their kids. Good. Very good, good. Uh, good advice. We uh, limit it. We don't yeah. eliminate it. We limit it. Absolutely. Super. Clear about that. Super, super advice. Uh, somebody wants to know, what are your thoughts on yellow street signs similar to those for deaf or blind people for neighborhoods with autistic children? I'm battling with my city trying to get one. They say they're only available for people with physical disabilities or sensory issues. I say to them that autism can be both but they won't listen. What kind of signs they're trying to get, I don't understand. They want to put up like a yellow sign like you would put up for a deaf child or for a blind child, notifying people in the neighborhood that they need to use caution and slow down. Um, and, and she wants to know what you think about that for to, to label. Uh, we had one in our neighborhood that said deaf child area so that people were just a little bit more aware. She's wanting to put up one that says autistic child. And she wants to know what your thoughts are on that. 
well, you could just get your own sign and put it up. That's true. That's true. But do you think there's anything negative in terms of doing that and notifying people well, in the neighborhood? One of the problem is, is I think drivers might get confused because they're going to know what a deaf child is. Yeah. But, you know, you're not sure what an autistic child's going to do. See, sometimes they get so much in their own world that they act like they're deaf. Yeah. They're not aware of what's going on around them. And so maybe if the concern is that the child elopes, maybe they maybe they need to put up a deaf child sign. I don't I don't I think well, what I she's think concerned I'd about is safety. Just put up a sign, something. Um, you know, you know. I know that a lot of people don't like the word handicapped, but I'm looking at drivers. You know, yes. going down a street for them to understand. I think they're going to react better to a sign that said handicapped child caution than than autistic child because they're not going to know how to react to that because okay. you know you don't know who's driving down that street great and speaking of driving our next question is about driving what challenges did you face when you first learned to drive my son is 16 has asperger's and doesn't want to drive but will if pushed to he's a very good driver with a few exceptions that make me too nervous to let him go out on the road alone just wondering how you felt and how you handled this experience well, I spent a year on easy roads before I did any freeways or did any traffic. Okay. You've got to get the driving, in other words, braking, steering, and gas, so practiced that it becomes like autopilot, yeah. where you don't have to think about that, and then ease into you know more difficult traffic. And that deals with the multitasking problem. He needs to just get hours and hours and hours behind the wheel, parking, driving in totally safe places, like a big supermarket parking lot, yeah. a little road in a suburban cul-de-sac. Yeah. Practice, practice, practice. Because what was done with me was out on my aunt's ranch. The mailbox was three miles away, and six days a week, I drove the car up them to the mailbox on a dirt road. Actually, it was a pickup truck with three on the column with a really awful, blocky clutch. <laughs> so that was six miles of driving I did a day with my aunt sitting right beside me nice. for an entire summer. And and that's a lot of practice. He's yeah. got to just get in the hours of practice. Okay. And then you and then you go on an easy suburban street where you know you gotta do a few lights, there's just a few other cars and you gradually work into more difficult situations. Okay. Were you excited to get behind the wheel though, or were you a little bit reluctant in the beginning? I was reluctant. My aunt just okay. said to me, We're gonna start to learn how to drive. Okay. And the very first day, she didn't make me deal with the clutch. <laughs> and so I sat beside her, and I steered the truck. Okay. And as soon as I got used to steering, then she got me in the truck, and I had to deal with the clutch, and the truck lurched forward. But we were in a dirt driveway where there was nothing to hit. Okay. And um, I had to learn how to work that clutch. But I was doing this all out on dirt roads where there was just no other, hardly any other cars around. Right. Right. Fascinating. Okay. Good. Uh, good. Uh, good to know. Uh, next question is about a 10 year old who protests for every single task, wants to really do nothing. What strategy do you suggest, Temple? Well, you say wants to do nothing. Yeah. Just, uh, what, what are some of the tasks he's being asked to do? Well, and she doesn't go into any further detail on that, but um, we, we do have a couple of other questions that have to do with this, too, of children who just really want to sit and veg, that they're, you know, being asked to get dressed, asked to go to school, asked to go outside and play, asked to engage in an activity, and, and it's not even that they're wanting to play video games, they just want to veg. And well, some of this is really, really high anxiety. Okay. Because I can remember one time getting into big panic attacks and wanting to just stay in my room and not do anything. And my mother would just come and get me out. Okay. There's one thing. They weren't going to let me be a recluse yeah. in my room. Yeah. Just wasn't going to be allowed. And when I was at the boarding school and I was not doing very much studying, I was doing a lot of horse stall cleaning. <laughs> but the place where they drew a line in the sand is I was not allowed to just stay in my room. I had to show up at meals. I had to show up at chapel. I had to go to movie night. And I didn't want to do movie night because I was nervous, so they made me projectionist. Oh, so was, great idea. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, and so, Temple, what were there consequences if you didn't do it, or were there incentives for doing it? Well, if I had just was going to totally stay in my room and not get dressed for church, there would have been consequences. Okay. And always rather severe ones. And and I and what did they offer you the incentive that you could do the spinning with the plate on your bed if you if you did do it? No, they didn't do anything like that. Okay. Um, I don't know if you got to remember. Uh, I just never got to that point because I, there were expectations okay. that I had to, had to come down to meals. Yes. And, uh, 
I can remember twice in my life getting spanked, and, you know, there was always that threat. Okay. And I also would get television taken away from me. Okay. And, and I wanted to watch the Howdy Doody show. And if <laughs> I tantrums and things like that, there'd be no Howdy Doody show for one night. Okay. Well, that's a pretty big consequence. Uh, all right. Somebody wants to know, what did you need from school that you did not get? Well, actually, I had a good elementary school education. You know, um, you know, where I got into problems at school was in high school. I just wasn't interested. In, in, you, know, you know, teenage girls, they're no longer interested in doing projects, and I still wanted to do projects. High school in a large girls' school was a disaster. I got thrown out for fighting because kids teased me. Uh, I know so some of the worst uh, parts of my life. We need to develop the areas of strength, like my ability in art was always encouraged, mm -hmm. and that became the basis of my career. Well, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, lovely compliments that people sent you. Somebody said, Temple, hello. You are an inspiration, intelligent, and caring woman. Thank you for your contributions to the world of autism. I have to ask you about the movie part with your mother. Uh, you and your mother are on the stairs. She has flashcards. She is slowly, slowly pronouncing uh, C-A-T, cat. C-A-T. Og. Da. Og. Temple, dog. Temple, cat at cat. Temple trough. Ma, me. Exactly what my speech teacher did. Okay. She slowed down and she enunciated the words. And I can remember her holding up a cup. She tended to use objects more than flashcards. And uh, she'd hold up a cup and she'd say, now say cup, cup, pa. And she'd slow down and enunciate the hard consonant sounds so I could hear them. Yeah. Because when the grown-ups talk really fast, it sounded like gibberish. In fact, I thought grown-ups had their own special language. Mm, interesting. We've heard many uh, autistic adults saying that the, when the words came in, they sounded like something completely different, and they seemed to go fast. So that's very interesting. And she wanted to know if you think that that type of, of work with a toddler is is important if they're on the autism spectrum. I mean, mean, would work with flashcards or work well, uh, child going one, going one, that slow one on one, um, and and going that slow that skill building. I think, I think autistic toddlers need lots and lots of one on one, and that's supported by all the research on yeah. applied behavior analysis or ABA. These kids need twenty or thirty hours a week of one on one teaching with an effective teacher yeah. that just kind of knows how hard to push the child. You know, you push them too hard, they have a meltdown. You don't push them enough, they don't advance. But some kids you have to slow down a whole lot, maybe others you do not. You know, that's gonna be very, very variable. Okay. My speech teacher would say, now say cup, and then she'd go, cup, pa. Okay, say cup. Okay, now cup, pa. She'd go back and forth between saying it regular and saying it very, very slowly. Okay, good advice. All right, so uh, we had a lot of questions about difficulties with getting kids to do homework, and I picked one in particular. Uh, she writes, my autistic daughter is nine years old and has meltdowns when it comes to doing homework, especially when it comes to putting pencil to paper, knowing she knows it in her head. At times she can rattle off the answers orally, and other times when it's the easiest of answers, like two plus two equals four, she says it's too hard. She cannot focus on the task. I give her little breaks and don't pressure her but a sheet of homework can last for hours and a lot of screaming stomping crying biting punching throwing things etc in between how do I make this a much simpler task for both of us she has been getting ABA therapy um, from school but they're not seeing a difference with what's happening at school well first of all I got to try to figure out what's going on here whether there's some kind of sensory problem with yeah. the writing instrument yeah. see this is the kind of thing where I've got to get a lot more information mm -hmm. about why she's throwing these fits I got to make sure that maybe she has a problem with fluorescent lights you know mm. in the place where she has to do the homework because this is sounding it's so severe yeah. it's sounding like a sensory issue my problem with doing homework is I just was not interested okay. it was not a sensory reason and I only knuckled down and started studying in high school when I had the goal of becoming a scientist. Mm. See, that's a different thing. And maybe a child that's got some kind of sensory issue doesn't like touching the paper or something. Mm. 
you know, maybe we should do our homework on a computer. You know, I, I don't know. I'd yeah. have to ask a lot more questions. So, but, but the potential to change the variables up, because it, it also strikes me that she mentions that does she can a lot of the times she can do the question in her head, but when it comes to the easiest of answers, that she says it's too hard. And I and I know you know, it's you just were mentioning that sometimes it was just it wasn't interesting to you. It was boring. Well, that's one thing. But the other thing is you can have um, you can have a kid that's like a lay like in other mm -hmm. words, they yak out all these TV commercials, but they don't know what they mean. Yeah. You see what might be happening, and I'm just saying I want to emphasize might be happening. Right. Is that um, you know the circuit in the brain for doing this with auditory is working, but maybe her vision, maybe she's got visual processing okay. problems and she's seeing kind of broken up stuff and she doesn't see the paper right. And in my book, The Way I See It, I've got two chapters in there where I address visual processing problems. Yeah. Maybe the print jiggling on the page, you know, and, and so in other words, she might be an auditory learner and maybe that's the way we need to approach things. Okay, interesting. So lots of different variables. And you mentioned your book, you've got a new book that's coming out. Do you want to tell us really quickly what the new book is? Well, the new book is going to be called The Autistic Brain. It's going to be released on April 30th. And um, I worked with a really great co-author, uh, Richard Panic, a super, super science writer. The first chapter reviews the history of the diagnostic criteria. Lovely. And I have to say it was rather shocking seeing yeah. the whole history just laid out um, uh, side by side, see how much they changed the yeah. diagnosis. Then the next chapter, we go into genetics research, and it's complicated genetics research. We have a whole chapter in sensory in there. Okay. And a lot of people are going to find helpful. I have a chapter on the different kinds of minds, visual thinking mind, the mathematics mind, word minds, and then a chapter on um, all my brain scans that have been done on me, and there's pictures of all the brain scans, and then a final chapter on... Um, on, on jobs for the different kinds of minds and getting people Lovely. prepared for careers. Lovely. Well, I can't wait to read this. And we actually have a bunch of questions about jobs that I'm going to get to before we get done. Um, really interesting question that caught my attention, wondering what you think about it. Somebody wrote in and said, my daughter talks to her, her hands as if they were puppets. She refers to her left hand as the bad hand and her right hand as the good hand. She sometimes puts things in between her fingers of her left hand as if they were eating something or putting things on top of it as a hat. She has different voices for each of them. She calls the left hand Jessie, named for a classmate of hers, and the right hand her name. Sometimes the hands smack each other. Could this be something that is going on at school that she's having a hard time telling us? My daughter does talk, but she has a hard time expressing how she is feeling and gets frustrated when I ask. Well, she may be just trying to act out with her hand. Yeah. You know, literally just using them as puppets. And I don't know how old this child is yeah, or what exactly either. the level of functioning is. But one of the things I've observed in autism is you can have, like, you know, like in my own case, for example, my visual thinking works really well, but my algebra department is broken. There's a tendency to be uneven skills. And she may be, um, uh, you know, talking, with, maybe things aren't hooked up all that well, but She's just trying to act it out with her hands because that's how she's trying to communicate. Absolutely. We had a lot of questions uh, from parents who, whose children don't speak and wanting your help. One in particular, my son is 10 and is totally nonverbal but very bright. He's the only student in his class that sight reads and he spells quite well, no tantrums, very affectionate, great eye contact, and very gentle but totally nonverbal. His developmental neurologist says he has a great constitution and could start talking soon. Is there anything I can do to help him start speaking. He does flap his hands and lines up his toys, but otherwise seems to be really far ahead of his other classmates. Well, what I'm wondering is maybe he needs to just start typing. Yeah. Like give him a laptop on, or even better at give him an iPad. And the reason why that works better is because when you type on the virtual keyboard, the print appears right next to the keyboard because some individuals that are nonverbal can't attention shift from print appearing on the top of a laptop screen and then have to look down at the keyboard. Mm. And that's why sometimes laptops don't work. Okay. iPad do. I would just introduce this kid to typing. Okay. Because I think he might become totally fluent typing. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great I, advice. I would definitely try that and, if, and, and I would probably start with an iPad because that solves the attention shifting problem. Love that. Uh, so many people wanted to know about t 
telling their child that they have autism and how when you knew that you were autistic and if you have suggestions about how to how and when to tell someone that they're on the spectrum well, the kid can read. I mean, I have the book, uh, Cy Montgomery book, Temple Grandin by Cy Montgomery, which is a really nice little book. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a number of children's books out. There's Little Rain Man by Karen Simmons. But the thing I, I'm seeing is I'm seeing too many kids on the high end of the spectrum getting hung up on their autism. Mm -hmm. All they want to talk about is their autism rather than about their science project or they like, um, you know, rocket ships or they like dogs or they like... Um, to do their math homework, you know, uh, I'd rather see them get hung up on, on something that something else. Yeah. You know, autism is an important part of who I am, but my other activities is my primary uh, identity. And now for older individuals, when they're having dating problems yeah. and marital relations problems, this is where the diagnosis is really helpful. Yeah. And I discussed this in my book, Different Not Less, where 14 people on the, um, on the spectrum get diagnosed in mm -hmm. 50s and 50s and 60s and that diagnosis really helped with their relationships yeah and all the people in that book had jobs all their life but i'm seeing too many smart kids getting so hung up on autism that they're not learning how to work and yeah. i think this was a serious problem yeah. and when i was um 13 years old i um i had a mother arranged a little job for me selling clothes for seamstress. When I was 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. When I was 16, I was uh, doing carpentry work, shingling the barn roof, you know, I, uh, painting signs for our school events. Mm -hmm. I had lots of work experience. Absolutely. How old were you when you first knew the word autism? Probably, you see, probably um, end of elementary school. Okay. And was it your mom who, who talked to you about it? Yes. yes. And how did she explain it to you, Temple? Well, you see, this is the thing. You've got to remember the era that I live in. Yeah. And there was no autism materials. There's no books or nothing yeah. that she could explain to me. She just explained that my brain was kind of different. And, and um, none of the materials that are available now were available. There were no support groups. Yeah. But... Uh, but in a way, you know, I mean, we all look at you and you've done so well. And, and clearly she explained it to you so that it was something that was different. And of course, we know that it was important for your mom to know that you were different, but but equal, not less. Different, but not less, as, well, as you've said. The other thing that was done with me is things I was good at was encouraged. But I wasn't praised for every little tiny thing mm. that I did. <laughs> you know, when I was around third or fourth grade, I made a beautiful clay horse and that was praised. Yeah. And when I did a very nice watercolor of a beach, that was put in a professional frame and hung on the wall with the professional pictures. And, but every little piece of art I brought home, you know, crummy little thing I brought home from school, I can remember an ashtray I made in the first grade. It was, uh, <laughs> this is, I know it's politically incorrect now to make ashtrays, but that was a first grade project. Yes. It was probably not worthy of praise. <laughs> when I did something really good, then she really praised it. Okay, so you knew when you did something well because she saved the praise for that. She saved the praise for the really good stuff. Okay, you brought up the whole idea of romance and relationships, and we had a lot of people writing in for advice about that. One mom in particular who said, my son is 17 and I would like to know, um, oh no, I'm sorry, that's another one. Uh, how can I help my 20-year-old son with autism meet a girl or at least a companion? There is no hurry, of course, as he is anxious and afraid to deal with such an issue. He already works, drives, and manages his bank account, helps pay his bills, etc. There are times that he would like to have someone his own age to go to movies with and or travel with. And we had lots of people who wrote in Temple and said, how do we help our teenagers and our young adults to meet people with like interests for the potential for romance? Well, I think we've got to get involved with the shared interests. I mean, uh, you know, I, I know a lady named Jennifer Myers, and she's got a very nice book on learning life skills. And Jennifer met her husband at a science fiction convention. Mm. That's an example of shared interests. Yeah. They're both computer people. Or they met each other at a history, historical reenactment society. It is all with events where you get these intense shared interests. Yeah. And that's where you can find a soulmate. You know, most of my friends are involved with autism, animal behavior, or, you know, scientific stuff. And so you have your, your core group of friends that shared interests. 
That's right. So get things get you get the get your son involved with you know, first thing I'd ask that mom is, what's your son interested in? Yeah. What's your son doing at work? Does he really like his work? Um, you know, obviously if his work was janitor work, I don't think he would have shared interest in that. Right. Let's say he worked for a computer company or he worked for, you know, something else something a bit more interesting, there might be a shared interest there. Okay. But that's where things are gonna be the best. It could be an art group, it could okay. be a drama group. It could be a choir, a church choir. It could be all. So then maybe you you do other singing things together. Okay, great. And and would you say that that because we also had people with younger kids writing in saying, how do I work on friendships without the romance? So would the same thing apply to the younger kids as yeah. well? Okay. Same thing. Shared interests. And the other thing we've got to work on is the turn taking. Yeah. And and the kid not totally monopolizing the conversation. You know, like this kind of a good rule of, you know, told, you know, I got fixated on things like carnival rides. Well, okay, I only tell that story twice, you know, because I go on and on about that and just drive people completely crazy. <laughs> Uh, it's the same thing, shared interests. Okay, wonderful. Uh, somebody wrote in, you were talking about algebra just a second ago. They were wanting to know, uh, they had heard you talking and saying that there was one type of math that was particularly difficult, if not impossible, for people with autism. Other people wrote in and said that wasn't quite exactly right, that you mentioned that you're not good with algebra, but they want to know, is that would that be true of all people with autism? And it seems like a lot of our viewers were concerned about uh, uh, math problems that are considered word problems, that their children are having well, difficulty yeah, with word those. Problems, I have a problem with word problems because you've got to like sequence information. And I just don't get a lot of the word problems. And but the, when it comes to things like algebra, it was horrible for me as a visual thinker. But there's other kids on the autism spectrum, they do algebra just fine. Yeah. So it's very variable. Okay. The pattern I tend to see, and I have a whole chapter on this in the Autistic Brain book, is is I'm a photorealistic visual thinker. I can visualize things photorealistically in my head. I have trouble with algebra. Then you have another kind of kid. He's a math genius. Yeah. He's good at everything in math, but may have trouble with reading. And then you've got a kid that's a word kid, and he'll know everything about his favorite movies or about you know cars or whatever his interest is. Math skills, just average, not a visual thinker. And then you've got others that are an auditory learner, mm -hmm. and they learn everything through their ears, and they are not a visual thinker, and often they have visual processing problems. So key is figuring out which one of those areas your child fits into which will help you to know how to address issues. Well, and the thing is you can get mixtures of these things okay. too. But those are definitely, you can get mixtures. Okay. But it's very, very variable. But there is a tendency to be good at one thing and bad at something else. That seems to be kind of universal, the uneven skills when you get on the higher end of the spectrum. Okay, awesome. We had a lot of questions about your mom, your awesome mom. Uh, somebody in particular wanted to know, what do you think your mother would say is the single most important thing she focused on when raising you? Well, she just focused on, she had a good sense of stretching me. Mm -hmm. She just knew how hard she could push. You know, push too hard to get a tantrum, but she was always stretching me just a little bit outside my comfort zone. I'm seeing too many kids that are kind of coddled too much, mm -hmm. and they aren't learning how to shop and things like that. Now, obviously, no surprises. Surprises cause panic. It absolutely cannot have sudden surprises. Okay. But she kind of just knew just how to put, kind of stretch me and get me to develop. Okay, awesome. What an awesome lady your mom is. Uh, somebody else wants to know, do you have strategies that you have found successful in working through emotional highs and emotional lows? Well, a lot of that's been controlled now with antidepressant medication. When I got it to be a teenager, a horrible time with constant panic attacks and anxiety, and that is controlled with um, antidepressant medication. Okay. And, um, you know, I have a lot of information on medication in the way I see it book mm -hmm. and thinking in pictures. Oh, there's way too many medications given out to little kids like candy. But okay. for me, a low dose of an antidepressant stopped the anxiety. Okay. And you've got to use very, very low doses because if you use too high a dose, you're going to get agitation and insomnia. I've had probably 100 parents say to me, oh, he did just wonderful on a low dose of Prozac, and we doubled it, and it was just horrible. Okay. He should have stayed on the low dose. And, and we had a lot of questions that came in about medication, of uh, those sorts, and people were wanting to know, how do you feel about prescription medications versus homeopathic medications for, for anxiety, if you have any preference? 
well, I think we need to get rid of all this fighting between the alternative and regular medication. In very young children, I definitely want to avoid heavy-duty drugs with bad side effects like the antipsychotics like Risperidol or Abilify. I want to try to avoid those in young kids. Mm -hmm. Let's do some of the diets first. Yeah. Those help a subset of kids. Dairy-free, wheat-free, maybe try some um, B vitamins and some magnesium. Fish oil supplements have a good effect on the brain. Uh, not eating a ton of sugar, getting plenty of exercise. Yeah. Let's do some of those things first. But there are some older kids and adults that are going to need some careful, conservative use of medication. And I recommend that you read um, Thinking in Pictures and my second edition of my Way I See It yeah. book. I also have some information on templegrandon.com. Okay, awesome. Uh, I love this question. We had a lot of questions about educating other people about how uh, how the autistic brain works and where I'm loving that you've got a whole book about this coming out the question is uh, how you learn to express the manner of your thought process so that others might understand how you think and thereby help you to understand how neurotypical people think my child struggles daily with making themselves understood in a neurotypical world and you seem to have gained an understanding if not an actual knack for it and I do think Temple I have to say that I think there are so many things about you that are wonderful but one of the greatest gifts I feel as a parent that you do give us that insight and, and you've shown us actually visit visually how your brain works and it's so eye-opening uh, how how can we help our other kids to be able to show us how their brain works well first of all when I was very young I, I didn't know that other people didn't think in pictures right. and one of the mistakes I made when I wrote thinking in pictures uh, was just thinking everybody on the autism spectrum thinks in, thinks in pictures, mm -hmm. which is not true. Mm -hmm. And then I started, you know, reading more and more stuff and learning more and more things and questioning people about how they think. I realized how my thinking was different. And there's going to be a whole chapter in the new book just on on uh, uh, this whole, you know, different ways people think. I mm -hmm. find this to be a very fascinating subject. Yeah. And I've read other self reports. You know, I have found that, you know, some of the brain research and some of the self-reports were some of the um, uh, uh, the best things that I read. Now, how can you tell if your little kid what kind of mind he has? It usually doesn't show up until third or fourth grade, eight or nine years old. Okay. That is when I did my really good artwork, and my visual thinking showed up as artwork. Things like making a very nice clay horse, for example, and drawing. And you want to encourage the kid to draw lots of other things. If the kid's good at math, that's going to show up, yeah. you know, in third or fourth grade. Kids good at reading, that's going to show up. First of all, what, you know, what subject is a kid good at? Does a kid like to build with Legos? That's mm. going to be both the visual thinkers and the mathematical thinkers. Mm. And then the word kids don't usually care about Legos. Interesting. Very interesting. Because I hear my kid in there. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. Um, okay. We have a question about um, dealing with when a child is perseverating on something. Um, because, and I, of course, I've lost it on the list here. But a parent who wrote in said when their child perseverates on something, that it raises their anxiety. And what advice would you give to the, the parent about dealing with the child's perseveration? Do they stop it or, or let it be? And then if they're going to let the child continue to perseverate on something, how do they deal with their own anxiety having to do with it? Well, I mean, what was done with my perseveration was allowed to have an hour after lunch where I could spin things. And uh, other times it was not allowed. Yeah. Dinner table, not allowed. So I think it's okay to give a child some times in the day where he can do some of this perseveration stuff. And then you have other times in the day where it's not allowed, like church and school and classroom. I think it's just fine when the kid gets home from school. He could have an hour to decompress and calm down and perseverate, maybe even play a video game for an hour. But then, I will, then, then after an hour, then I want to stop it. And then for the parent who's feeling the anxiety when their child is perseverating, any advice on that, Temple? Well, I would just tell them that if you limit it, uh, not to worry about it. Okay. They do these things to calm down. And I think it's best to allow some scheduled time where some of this stuff is allowed, and then other times we don't do it, like at okay. the table, for example. Right. I love this question. I can't wait to hear your answer. Somebody wrote in, with your ability to see details, do you have any ideas or solutions for how Colorado can conserve or channel our water to be of better use for our crops? 
Oh boy, I didn't have to do a lot of studying on that. Okay. I don't have the knowledge to, you know, to answer that one. Now pictures started to come into my head. I started seeing satellite photographs. Uh-huh. I started seeing uh, when I lived in Arizona the Salt River Dam uh, dams and things. But there's a lot of stuff I I, I don't know okay. about that to say anything. Okay, but I love I love getting an insight into how you begin to problem solve. Uh, very fascinating. Well, the first pictures that came into my head were satellite photos okay. that show rivers. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, a lot of people interested in, in your schooling. One person in particular who wrote it and said that they also attended the Hampshire Country School in New Hampshire from 78 to 81. Uh, that was the same private school that you attended. They want to know what you- would have been gone by that point. And, and they want to know, did you know Miss Adelaide Patey, the director of the school? Oh, absolutely, I did. Adelaide was there, and then, and then Henry Patey was there. Oh, yes, I knew Adelaide Patey really, really well. Wonderful. I'm sure they'll be thrilled to hear that. Um, lots of questions about finding jobs for kids that are on the spectrum and and making sure that it's something that keeps uh, their interest, and in particular about what to do earlier to get a child ready with job skills before they reach the age of 20. I think we need to start with 13-year-olds. Uh, uh, this is the age where kids used to get paper routes, and I know the paper routes are gone now. And if you do have a paper route available, you know, if it's a high-functioning kid, give them a paper route. So let's do other activities outside the home. How about walking dogs? Okay. And the thing I like about that is you have to do it every single day, rain or shine. Uh, you know, let's figure out jobs in the neighborhood. How about a tour guide at a little local museum? Some museums will take them at age 12. You know, when they're 16, they can volunteer at an animal shelter. They could work at a um, at a farmer's market. They could make PowerPoints for business people. They could fix computers for local businesses. These are things that parents need to just set up in the community with little local businesses to get kids doing things. They've got to learn the discipline of work, and I think it needs to start at 13. Wow. But I also think it's never too late to start. I mean, you might have a 22-year-old that's been sitting around. We've got to get him out of the house, and he's got to start doing things. Okay. I talked to some parents the other day. Dad owned a store, and their son had problems with the cash register, an mm-hmm. old-fashioned very old-fashioned cash register. I said, you know, Dad, why don't you buy a scanner? Because uh, <laughs> uh, there's problems there with multitasking. Let's just buy a scanner. Yeah. They're not that expensive now. And then he, then he, the 22-year-old's going to get his butt out of the house, and he's yeah. going to learn how to use the scanner, and that's not going to tax multitasking. There because the problem that you have is long strings of verbal information are not remembered, and multitasking can be a real problem. Absolutely. Uh, got got a, a question from a friend. She says, I have an autistic friend. He's pretty social, but he can't read and doesn't have a job. His parents have a lot of money, and he doesn't need to worry about working. He has certain obsessions like Bigfoot and movie action figures. For the most part, his obsessions are fully supported. He's been on Bigfoot hunts and spends thousands of dollars on action figures every year. I'm just wondering if you feel that it's okay to be following the same interests he's had as a kid, or do you think he should be guided to try to learn and read into more adult areas of his life and push to do more things? He's never well, been... I think we have to do, Go ahead. do with fixations is we need to broaden them out. When I was very young, I drew constant horse heads all the time. Mm-hmm. Well, you've got to broaden that out. Okay, okay, let's do the horse's stable. Let's draw a picture of a place where a horse might go. In other words, broaden it out. Okay. Okay, Bigfoot hunts. Well, let's learn about, you know, some of the woods and the habitat with Bigfoot lives. Okay. You know, start an interest in botany, maybe. You see how I'm making an associative yes. link. Also, this kid should have been, you know, learning some work skills. Yeah. Now, I don't know exactly what his level of functioning is. You know, that that's something where I'd have to ask those parents some more questions. Right. So I could... I could think of a job that would be appropriate for his level of functioning, but I would definitely try to try to you know channel channel this into something else. And okay, we can go on a Bigfoot expedition, but then let's learn about some of the plants that um, are in that forest there where you go. went on that expedition. Okay, so broaden it out. A lot of questions about schooling and recommendations for schooling. Some about uh, one in particular. My son has Asperger's and he's continually bored in school. Do you recommend homeschooling? Uh, I don't even know how old this child is. No, I know, and I don't I don't either. know anything about it. 
you know, I would have to ask more questions. I was one of the teenagers that had to be taken out of a regular school. Mm -hmm. But if you homeschool a kid, you can't just let them become a recluse in the house. Right. They've got to be out. You've got to get lots of activities planned where they're out doing things. And if you're homeschooling, high-functioning teenager, I think we need to get him a job outside the home. Okay, great. Uh, I love this one. Any advice you can give someone teaching an autistic child how to ride a horse? Oh, some kids do just great on a horse, mm -hmm. and they oftentimes are a little bit afraid when they get on, but there's some nonverbal kids that said their first words on a horse, because there's something good about the rhythm and balancing. Now, I want to emphasize, it's not for everybody. Yeah. You know, therapeutic Absolutely. riding is really wonderful for some kids and not appropriate for others. Same thing with service dogs. For some kids, it's absolutely the best thing, but there's other kids that are terrified of dogs yeah. because they never know when it's going to bark and hurt their ears. Right. So for one child, it's appropriate. For another child, it's not. Okay. Uh, talking about math, and we talked about algebra a little bit, somebody wrote in and said, my 18-year-old son struggles with algebra, too, because he can no longer do the math in his head and hates calculators working on them, but is excellent in chemistry, biology, principles of architecture, and con construction. He wants to be a civil engineer. However, I don't know if the math is going to be a struggle and hold him back. Do you have any advice? Well, I couldn't do algebra. So I basically had to go into the field of industrial design. Okay. Uh, you know, when you build projects, you have both the like industrial design part, the art part, the architecture part. And unfortunately, a lot of universities require algebra. And the only way I got through college was in back in 66, the required math class was finite math, mm. which is matrices, probability, and statistics. And I get worried that this algebra requirement is going to, like, block a lot of people on um, now, if the problem is doesn't want to use calculators, I'd like to try to figure out some way to get around that. I also find kids that cannot do algebra go to geometry and calculus just fine. You know, there's, there's, there seem to be like spotty skills. I've seen situations where the child um, uh, was, was, was passing high-level physics and couldn't graduate from high school. I think one of the ways to get around this is to sign up for a few classes in the college in things you're good at and do so good that you get a professor interested in you, and there can be ways to get around some of these requirements. You know, but he's going to need to go in there and do gorgeous architecture projects or something like that, and then sometimes you can get in the back door. And then I'd want to ask more questions about why the calculator is such yeah. a problem. Maybe we get a different kind of calculator. Okay, interesting. Uh, lots of questions about music. Do you like music? Is music a comfort to you? And do you think music is a beneficial thing to teach individuals on the autism spectrum? Absolutely, yes. There are some kids that can learn to sing their words before they learn to speak them. Mm -hmm. because singing is on different circuits. So, um, yes, I think music definitely should be introduced to kids. There are some kids where high-pitched sounds are going to hurt the ears, mm -hmm. so maybe flute might be a bad idea. Okay. There's others that don't like drums. Yes, I definitely, you know, if they, they, they really like music, then go with it. Okay. And, and do you like music? Do you personally find it relaxing? Do you listen to music? Yeah, I like to listen to some classical. I mm -hmm. like Johnny Cash country. And, okay. and uh, there's certain kinds of pounding rock that I just hate. Okay. It's sort of like a, you know, jackhammer on my head, but uh, a lot of music I like. Do you listen to music in the car when you're driving? Yes, I, yes, I do. And Johnny Cash is your favorite? Yeah, that's one of my favorite CDs. I also really like Beatles. Oh, cool. Very, very cool. Um, another person who writes, I, I read where you said that before you became verse, uh, verbal, you would get so frustrated you would scream. I have a seven-year-old grandson who is high-functioning on the spe uh, spectrum. He has a speech delay, but is now verbally fully verbal, excuse me, and in a regular first grade class. Uh, his two and a half year old brother chatters a lot, but says very few real words. However, he does a lot of screaming and grunting. I can tell it is out of frustration. Do you remember what happened when you finally began to speak? Was it the result of speech therapy or did you just w wake up one morning and start talking? No, I had problems with expressive language and I had a hard time getting my words out. And you'll see brain scans in the autistic brain book that show how I had difficulty uh, getting my words out because the circuits were smaller than normal. And speech, speech problems can be variable. You can have problems with expressive language, problems with hearing, uh, where the hard constant sounds are not heard, or the kid might be echolalic, but he doesn't know what it means. My speech came in slowly, okay. a few stressed words at a time. But I want to emphasize, these things are very variable. 
Okay. But uh, but I, I listen to you now, Temple, and you are so expressive and you are such a brilliant speaker. Is it just that you continued to work and that you're, the people around you just didn't let up and, and kept working on those skills with you? What what do you attribute your success to in the area of, uh, in this area of verbal communication? A lot of hard work. You've got to keep, you keep learning. When I gave my first talk in graduate school, I panicked and I walked out. Mm -hmm. And you just get better the more you do it. You just keep learning. It's gradual. There's no single turning point, no single breakthrough. Okay, absolutely. Well, and I know we have to let you go in a minute. Have we got you for just like two more minutes? Okay. Okay. Um, I, I want to know, you talked a little bit about art, um, and we had many questions, people writing about art, and for kids who already seem to have an ability with art, it, how, how much do we want to encourage that with autism? And for children who get frustrated doing art, is it something that we want to keep massaging and have them um, continue, don't give up on art, have it be a part of their curriculum? Well, if the child's good at art, I want to develop it. Because okay. art's the basics of my design career. The child's good at art, develop it. You know, I wasn't allowed to just do constant horse heads. You know, we're going to have to learn how to draw other things. And if you have a child that absolutely hates art, you know, there's a point where I'm going to back off. Okay. You know, they don't pound on the thing that they, that they have difficulty with. Build on the area of strength. Build on the thing the child's good at with the goal of turning it into a career. Okay. Uh, a question about learning other languages. People wanted to know oh, if you think that's a... Terrible <laughs> They want to know if you studied Latin. I never studied Latin, but okay. I got a D in French. Okay. But then on the other hand, you've got autistic kids that absolutely excel at language. Okay. This is where you get back to the uneven skills. Right. Some are going to be super good at this, and others are going to be super bad like me. Okay, we are out of time, but we appreciate you so much, Temple. You are an inspiration to all of us, and I hope that, I know you got a lot of things to do to promote your book. Again, it's called The Autistic Brain, and it comes yes, out on the 30th right. of April. And, yes, and you can pre-order on Amazon now. Okay, great. So we want everybody to do that. We we just absolutely adore you. We hope that once you're done promoting the book that we can have, because I have pages more of questions and pages more of praise that uh, we might have to email to you because so many people wanted to tell you how much they adore you, how much you've helped them with their children, and individuals who are on the spectrum, how much you've inspired them. So we thank you so much, Temple. Well, thank you, and I hope I've given some parents and uh, teachers some insight today. You absolutely and, uh, have. You I can't emphasize enough the importance of good uh, good teachers and, and people that just, you know, work with me. Well, uh, we, we appreciate that, and I think you've given great advice for all of them. And I hope you can dig out from the snow. Okay. Thank you all so right. much. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah, bye. What is it like for you personally to have become the most celebrated person in the field of autism? Well, I feel it's a responsibility. I get a lot of emails and letters from young kids. In fact, at the last conference I was at, I got a whole envelope of uh, letters from kids in an English class. What makes me pleased is I think I'm inspiring a lot of kids to succeed because I want to see kids succeed. Now, one problem I'm seeing with some of the fully verbal kids is they're not getting stretched enough. I see kids coming up to me at conferences where nobody's taught them how to shake hands. See, when I was a young child, I had to be party host at my mother's parties. I had to shake hands, say please and thank you, have table manners, learn how to shop. And I'm seeing three situations where they aren't learning those basic skills. Yeah, so you, you really think they need the basic skills that every child should learn. Yes, now in the 50s, every child was taught social skills in a much more structured way. And today, that's not the case. Now, the so-called normal kids, they pick it up. But the autistic kids have got to be taught. Okay. And that's not being done enough. What kind of preconceptions, though, do you think most people have about relating to those with ASD? Autism is a really big spectrum. You're going all the way from Silicon Valley down to somebody with a lot of intellectual challenges. Now, the kinds of services and things a person needs are very different those two ends of the spectrum. 
And I go to different places. I go to Silicon Valley, I see a lot of people that I know are on the spectrum. And then I go see another kid that's smart at math, but nothing's being done to develop his skills and he's getting addicted to video games. And they are the same kind of kid. The thing that I'm seeing, especially on the mild end of the spectrum, is too many kids sort of becoming the label. I'm very concerned about them getting a handicap mentality. Then I go over to the meatpacking plant, and there's a whole maintenance shop of old hippies that I know are on the spectrum, and they run that maintenance shop. And they've been there for years and years and years. Why do you think the numbers, 1 in 68 now, have risen so dramatically? I think on the mild end of the spectrum, it's increased detection. Because I can think of kids I went to elementary school with, kids I went to college with, that today would be diagnosed on the spectrum. I think that's a big part of it on the mild end of the spectrum. Now, I think there also is some severe autism that may have actually increased because there's more environmental contaminants and there's more medications uh, being given uh, during early pregnancy. Dr. Grant, and you beg parents not to let their children with autism be defined by the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Why? Well, I think the DSM made a big mistake removing Asperger's syndrome because under the DMS-4, autism, you had to have speech delay. Asperger was no speech delay. Now, you could argue scientific reasons for taking out the speech delay stuff, but from a service provider standpoint, you know, the kind of services that somebody's nonverbal as is different than a mild kid with Asperger's. And I'm seeing too many fully verbal kids, less severe than me, getting put into a class with uh, nonverbal kids. I'm seeing too many smart kids uh, not learning job skills. That's another thing that I really push. Because when I was 13, my mother had got me in a sewing job. When I was 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. Uh, it's really important that students intern in a job before they graduate from high school. They've got to learn that discipline of um, getting to work. If you could speak to every business owner in America, what would you say to convince them to hire somebody on the autism spectrum? Well, there are certain things they can do extremely well. In fact, the SAP Corporation is hiring people with autism. There's another um, project, Project Search, where they, um, there's work being done with collaborating with hospitals to train them to set up surgical in instruments for different types of surgery and they take longer to train, but once they're trained, they're super, super good and meticulous about making sure the instruments are set up right, and that's got about a 78% uh, uh, employment rate. So you think the skills that those with ASD have to offer are often overlooked by people well, that I can, employ? Well, as I said before, I can think of kids that I went to college with that definitely were on the autism spectrum. Those individuals are all employed in good jobs. And I think a lot of this gets back to pounding those manners in in the 50s and the 60s and kids being on things like paper routes where they learned work skills. Why do you think the experts in the field of ASDs focus so intensely on the deficits and not on the strengths of well, autism? Well, we need to be building up strengths. My ability in art was always encouraged. And I was encouraged to do lots of different kinds of art. If you've got a third grader that's good at math, and he can do a high school math book, let him do the high school math book. Don't hold him back. I want to know why you think that so little attention has been paid to the sensory processing issues. What can we learn from those? Well, I just heard about a brand new study that's been done up at the uh, in California, Dr. Wu, and they took um, children aged 4 through 12 that had speech delay, and they stayed in their regular programs, ABA or whatever the speech therapy the school was doing, and then they got an hour a day of sensory therapy where they did a lot of variety of stimulation, like walk on different kinds of flooring, smell different smells, do different activities in a mirror, big variety, always doing more than one sensory thing at a time. And it was done as a controlled experiment where half the kids just got the regular treatment and the other half got this added sensory treatment. And they got some really big significant improvements. And they made the point of using all very inexpensive things that would be in any house. There's so much division in the autism community. How do you think we can all come together well, and find a common ground? I think that merging Asperger's together with autism has made all of this worse. Because you have a segment of very, very severely handicapped kids where they're never going to be able to live independently. That's a very different kind of situation than a mild Asperger's type of kid, you see you're, you're, you're putting too many apples and oranges together. Every other diagnosis like dyslexia, learning problems, ADHD, you've got a fully verbal kid. Only in autism right now are you getting a range going from, you know, smart computer geek 
down to somebody who has very, very severe challenges. Now, I think the American Psychiatric Association originally figured the Asperger kids would get into this social communication category. That's not what's happening. Nobody's going into that because there's no funding for it. As the most admired person in this field, and we are literally becoming an autism nation, what do you think the most important thing is for us to be aware of? Well, there's a point where personality variants are just normal variation. I think a brain can be made more cognitive and thinking, or a brain can be made more social. Now, at what point does that become abnormal? There's no black and white dividing line. I'm getting concerned that what we're saying is abnormal is, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Obviously, a child that has severe speech delay, that's an abnormality. But when you take the kids that are just kind of socially awkward, a lot of those kids are really smart. And then you got the person that's a total social butterfly. And let's think back to the caveman days. I don't think the social yak yaks around the campfire made the first stone spear. <laughs> Dr. Grandin, thank you for inspiring all of us as parents and children. <laughs>